Good evening. I'm going to call uh, the meeting of the ZBA to order, please. Um, we have some initial housekeeping issues to take care of, and then we can move to the, the main event, so to speak. Um, the first matter on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the September 25th, 2012 hearing of this board. Um, I move to... I move to approve the minutes as set forth here. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Unanimously approved. Um, just as a, a, a point related to that, I'm going to ask people when they talk tonight that everyone please come up to the, to the podium. I know we had some people getting up and speaking from other places in the crowd, um, and I was told that it was made it very difficult to transcribe the minutes later on because you couldn't hear some of the, the comments. So. It's a little bit, little bit awkward, but if, you need, if someone needs to speak, well, I'm going to have to ask you to come up to a microphone. Um, I'm unaware of any old business that remains other than um, continued hearing on the appeal regarding building permit number 130072. Um, is there any other old business that anyone is aware of? Okay. Um, before we get to that, um, are there any communications that anyone is aware of to the board or from the board? No? All right, then uh, I think we will return to um, our pending matter. Again, the appeal of uh, Maynard and Deborah, Deborah Murphy of the CEO's 831-2012 issuance of a building permit number 130072 for replacement of a 50 by 20 foot concrete patio with a 20 foot by 20 foot stone patio in the construction of a retaining boulder wall at 29 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 69. Now, as I think most people here are aware, we did a site walk uh, earlier this month, and I think not all, not all of the board was there, but most of the board was there. And um, that, I think that was helpful for us to get an understanding of exactly where things lay on the, on the lot. and where the house is and where the patio is and where the retaining wall is and so on and so forth. Um, I know that we had closed public comment at the last hearing, but I think that it might be appropriate for us to reopen it to hear more comments from the crowd or from, from interested parties um, to the extent that we're getting new comments or, or things are going to help us here. So I, I guess I would ask uh, that we take a vote on that, whether we should reopen or not. Can we limit comments just to um, this particular issue with regard to the Livingston's lot? I, I think that that is, I think that's very reasonable at this point. So uh, I move that we reopen public comment. All in favor? Okay. Um, we, if anyone wants to be heard on um, the pending matter. Attorney Andrew Duchette uh, for the Murphys. I, I guess I'd, this might be more a procedural matter. I believe we left uh, the last hearing uh, with respect to the appeal on permit 130072 uh, on the issue of standing. We never had quite gotten to, to the actual merits of the, uh, of the appeal and, and, and why we were seeking an appeal and what we thought was uh, uh, not in compliance with the permit. I guess the question is, is whether or not the board wants to hear more on the argument of standing, I submitted some material uh, on or about October 16, 2012. I think you've also received some additional material from Attorney Schumadine. Um, I'm happy to speak on the issue of standing some more, but I, I guess I just want some direction as to where uh, the board would like, like us to go on this. I'd note on the standing issue, it seems like it, although we're just dealing with this particular appeal, it in many ways is going it, it's very similar to the standing, at least from my perspective, that will apply with the Shore Acres Association. So from that perspective, I, I personally don't think I need to hear any more on the standing issue. I don't know how the rest of the board feels. I don't believe I need to hear any more on the standing issue. So unless anyone else would like to hear more, you're certainly welcome to. Because we had called that out as kind of a separate line item, do we want to 
address standing first and then go to kind of general merits of the application? Yeah. I, I, I'm in favor of that. Um, why don't we close public comment on the standing issue and then we'll, no, I think that's right. Then we'll, we'll reopen it on, on the merits if, if we get there. So um, all in favor of closing discussion, public discussion, all in favor? Do we need a second? Anyone second? Second. All in favor? All right, we will, we will can discuss among ourselves the issue, the issue of standing here. I can tell you just as sort of a threshold matter, I think that, that the Murphys have shown standing here. Um, as I think both sides have conceded, it's a, it's a, it's a relatively low threshold to cross here, and, and I, I'm comfortable with um, a conclusion that they have met that burden and they do have standing. So I don't know what the rest of the board feels on the, on the issue, but that's, that's where I stand as of right now. That's where I stand as of right now. That's where I stand as well. I agree. All right, well, probably to make it official, we should probably vote on that. So if someone wants to, to make a motion on that. Um, I move that the Murphys have standing to proceed with the uh, appeal. Okay. I second. All in favor? All right, it's passed. And the Murphys are deemed to have standing for purposes of uh, the ZBA hearing and on uh, building permit number 130072. So with that, I think we'll reopen and we can actually get to the merits. Um, with respect to permit uh, 130072, uh, that and, and I recognize that there's been some subsequent um, uh, uh, amendments, I guess, for a lack of a better word, with respect to the permit. Uh, but initially, the permit looked to move uh, an existing patio, uh, replace it with a, a revised patio, and as well as uh, put in a erosion control retaining wall. Again, why the Murphys bring this uh, appeal, similar to some of the other appeals they've uh, brought recently is with respects to uh, one that the, uh, they can test the starting point for where the 75 foot uh, buffer uh, shoreland buffer is was taken Two, uh, with respects to uh, the uh, lock coverage um, and, and then three I guess you know more of the fact that uh, the, the procedure in which uh, in which the you know the the initial uh, site plan was deficient, uh, setbacks weren't properly established, boundary lines weren't properly established, um, le leaving anyone who initially goes to the uh, goes to the town to pull the plans to look at it and, and make a determination as to what's going on here, uh, um, uh, um, almost impossible. Uh, and I think, and again, in pointing to my October 16th letter, I kind of show the chronology of how, uh, you know, how the, you know, how various plans were were submitted related to different uh, different projects that were going on, and how those plans all seemed to benefit whatever that project might have been. Um, and so, for example, uh, again, just focusing on this particular permit. Uh, there's no mention, uh, at least in the initial plan, there's no mention of the right of way. Um, uh, again, the 75 foot setback is just set from the mean normal high water line. Uh, we would contend, and I think we contend in, in, in many of our filings, that the, the, the proper uh, starting point for the 75 foot uh, setback is the top of the bank. Uh, interestingly enough, that's where uh, the town of Cape Elizabeth has uh, used the starting measure for the 250-foot shoreland zone, and that's depicted in your in your uh, town ordinance. Uh, the 75-foot mark starts at the you know you can't pick and choose uh, for whether it's for the 250 versus the 75-foot where you're going to start uh, where you're going to start that measurement from. Councilor, yes. I, a quick question on that. It, it seems that we do in a way have a finding from the DEP as to where the shoreline boundary is by virtue of the letter from Mike Morse? Uh, 
Mike Morris was just speaking with respects to DEP. Uh, and the DEP, uh, and I've had several conversations with Mike Morris over the last couple of weeks, but the DEP's uh, definition of where the starting line begins uh, doesn't necessarily apply here in, for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, the municipalities can have a more restrictive method, uh, and I would, I would submit to you in this case that um, that's the case. In addition, I, you know, with all due respect to Mike Morris, I, I think the DEP uh, zoning guidelines are clear as well, is that uh, when you're looking as to whether, you, you don't even get to uh, looking at the um, uh, mean night normal high water line and because and, and what you're going to end up doing is looking at um, uh, as to whether or not there's any um, uh, uh, salt water vegetation or things of that nature. Can you take me back a couple steps? Sorry. Certainly. I am trying to figure out exactly what the issue is. And, and by that I mean, why does the 75 foot setback, if you will, or buffer area, it's not a setback, my apologies, um, matter? What is at issue? Is it just the um, patio or small deck that's in the easement area? What is the issue? Uh, certainly, the the issue is that um, because uh, because the work that was going to be performed was in that setback, it's any work. It's considered a non-conforming structure. Why is it non-conforming? It, it's non-conforming under your ordinance because it's mm -hmm. within the the setback. It's within, it's within that within seventy five. It's zone. within that seventy five foot. Well, not just within the shoreland. There's other there's other issues within the shoreland itself that would make it non-conforming that gets more to the 20% uh, rule. And all so that. decks like this generally are not allowed in the shoreland zone. This is an existing non-conforming use that has been relocated and reconstructed? It hasn't been relocated. Because it's okay. a non-conforming structure, it can't, you can't just issue a permit as this. It needs to go in front of, it needs to go in front of you folks to determine whether or not the, uh, the, what, is, what has been requested it will be allowed. Are, are we um, talking about the, the deck or the, the patio? We're talking about the patio and the retaining wall and the fill that was so so taking put them in. taking them separately. Th so that's all part of the one permit. I'm just focusing on oh, the one right. permit. Okay, and taking, taking the deck is a whole other issue. I'm sure you're going to hear about that today. Um, and and I I didn't we didn't bring that appeal. That's not part of the appeal in front of you. So, so you're looking them at separately. Yeah, if you're just looking at uh, permit uh, again number. 130072, uh, that permit seeks to uh, put in an erosion control retaining wall, which you've seen and has been moved. Uh, and it looks to what was an existing patio, uh, revise that patio, take some of it out, uh, put in a new uh, one. Um, and at least that was all that was uh, re requested in that permit. Um, and again, we, you know, would, would it, um, what else was done, I think, within this work project was uh, the retaining wall in the steps, uh, the addition of fill, um, and then as well, and then the patio itself. And are you grouping them all together and saying if any of this is is inside of the 75-foot buffer zone, then none of the work could be done? That no, I'm what saying about? that. And again, it's it, whether the work, I, and I think that's where there's some confusion as to whether or not the work could or could not be done. The problem is, is that it wasn't up to uh, Mr. Smith to make that determination. But uh, setting, setting that aside, let's start okay. with the patio. Yes. You would concede that the patio is outside of the 75-foot buffer zone? No. 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 So you think the patio is within the 75-foot buffer zone? Yes. If you the if the but taking the 75-foot sure. uh, measurement from the top of the bank. Uh, so it's I, I think it's there's no dispute that at least part of the patio is within this this patio is okay. within the the closer patio that's near the deck right. is the one at issue. No, that's that's oh, okay. not correct. Okay. Okay. No. What patio is we're, the issue? We're, we're patio adjoining the house. the house. The one attached to the house. So you're saying right. that's within 75 feet? Yes, if, it was, if you're measuring from the top of the bank, not the high, mean normal high water line. They put the mean normal high water line about 50 feet out from the top of the bank. Do we have 
some type of document where you have a surveyor who's measuring the 75 foot from where you believe it should start? Uh, no, because we weren't allowed to survey the property. Okay. Um, well, and, and again, and, and again, it's not up to the Murphys to prove uh, whether or not their, their site plan is accurate and correct. It's up to the Livingstons to do so. And, and, when you, and, if, and if you're just looking at their site plans, all of them, even the new ones that they've submitted, uh, none of them are accurate because, the, again, they keep taking the 75-foot measurement from the mean normal high water line. Are they signed? You're, sorry. Excuse me, are they signed by an engineer? What's that? Are these plans signed by an engineer? Uh, they were never certified. They were not certified. They were or they weren't? They were not. Okay. I believe uh, some of the recent uh, submiss uh, uh, submittals were from a surveying company, but they weren't certified. So, so what the, the Murphys are arguing is that this deck that's attached, this patio that's attached to the house, and this boulder wall are within the 75-foot shoreland zone are therefore non-conforming and therefore to the extent there was any relocation or um, change in those non-conforming structures within the shoreland zone they needed to come to the ZBA in order to determine whether they the work that was done was as compliant as possible with setback requirements is that right that's correct okay and, and, and again, um, the other reason, and, and, and I'll have uh, Mr. Murphy uh, explain in a minute as well, the other reason why this was considered, uh, any of the projects actually on the site were considered non-conforming was because uh, they were already, the, the existing structure was already over the 20% lock coverage rule. And that applies within the entirety of the 250-foot uh, shoreland zone. Now, Aren't there some exceptions where uh, a landowner or a homeowner can reconstruct um, uh, can reconstruct a structure that has been destroyed that's non-conforming? Uh, yes, yes. And again, I, I, I think, th and that's, you know, again, that's getting at the crux of what the issue is: is whether or not uh, uh, Bruce Smith had the authority to to issue the perm the permit to begin with. Um, and it, and, it, and it also goes to the process. Um, you, you very well may have, say, uh, have said that it provided the procedure was uh, appropriately followed that, uh, you know, the, the plans with respect to the revised patio, again, the patio that's attached to the building, that's okay. But you may not have said we're okay with the, uh, the retaining wall because uh, initially on this particular plan, it, was, uh, it would have been in the right of way. They, the Livingstons don't even have right title and interest to do the work performed in that area. It would have given the opportunity for uh, public discourse and, and people to express their feelings with respect to the Livingstons' plans. Um, and, and that wasn't followed. That's the reason why I think you have the crowd you've been having here a lot. Can we be a little bit clear about what TRI is and isn't? I mean, certainly the Livingstons are the owner of the fee of the entirety of this property, correct? I, I would argue that they're not. Um, and again, I Do think you LP have any deed information that indicates that there is any other right uh, in that property uh, other than an easement right? Yes, I believe that the, this was an issue that uh, was, um, I'm not sure if it's litigated beforehand, but the Shore, uh, Shoreland Acres was involved in that. And I believe there was some dis uh, discussion as to whether or not who actually owned that right away, and I think that was determined. And again, without, I don't want to be stepping on the, uh, on the next field that will follow and the comments that are going to be made there, but um, uh, again, I believe that, that that matter has already been kind of discussed and resolved, and the boundary line of the Livingston's property is actually uh, to that right of way. They, they, not, they don't own the fee uh, underneath it. I would look to someone to point me in the direction of those documents um, for, with regard to this appeal, with regard to TRI, because I have not seen anything to that effect. So this, this, what you're handing me right now is from the Shore Acres Improvement Appeal? Yeah. yeah. Can I?
So right now I'm being asked to look at documents from a separate appeal as part of TRI on this appeal. I have a list. I have mine. On the oh. last page of this appeal, depending on which party drafted this, there's an indication as to the rear property line. Okay. I don't know which party That's drafted it. That's their hand on that. Yeah. From which party? If, if we'll assist the board, they're entitled to present whatever evidence they think might be relevant to the issues that you have to decide with regard to this appeal. If that means relying upon information which happens to be contained in some other appeal, which is pending for later, um, then you can take a look at it. This is just referencing an easement deed, though. And, it, and, it, and I think a, re, and a release deed with respects uh, from, uh, from Shore Acres Lands Company, and then it lists. Just for uh, an easement in common to travel by foot and use for passive recreation. That's not a fee interest, correct? It's just an easement deed. And, and getting back to your early point, Joanna, I think regardless of, you know, again, when looking at the, the matter of right title and interest, uh, I don't think they have the, um, uh, the, the right, again, to, to encroach upon that right of way, whether it's with rock walls, uh, decks, things of that nature. And again, I don't want to get too much within the, the other appeal, but uh, I, for think example, what? I think it's integral to your appeal to establish what rights it is of your clients that um, are being imposed on. Um, and, and by that, I guess what I'm saying is, to the extent you're saying that there is a problem with the boulder wall being in that easement area, and that the problem with the Livingston's actions was that they didn't have right title and interest in order to put that wall in there, then we do need to know what it is that is indicating that they don't have that right title and interest to do that. Again, I, I think that's a matter for the board to determine. If, if the board is saying that uh, somebody, uh, whether it's uh, uh, a right of way, an easement, if, if if the board is going to construe that, that somebody that gives them enough right title and interest uh, to make you know to make changes within that area, uh, that's uh, that's up for the board to to determine. Um, um, and uh, I'm going to thank Mrs. Murphy for pointing this out. If if you look at the uh, the the deeded easement uh, within that. Within that easement, it does uh, indicate that, um, with respect to those parties, uh, those properties that are burdened from it, uh, that they can't make any changes to or building improvements on the land uh, within that within that area. Can you show me? Can you show us what you're looking at? Uh, if you look at page two on the easement deed. Uh, Not the release deed, the easement deed? Uh, the release deed. Okay. Whatever we want to call it. We're looking at the release deed at this time? Yeah. Right uh, and if you look at the uh, uh, one, two, third full paragraph down, beginning uh, as used in this easement deed, the term passive recreational activities. And then it goes on and it talks about um, the current natural setting of the land which setting grantor and grantees agree shall be preserved. Is that what you're talking about? Correct. But that, that's talking about the use of the easement. Right. 
by the people who the easement is granted to. That's a restriction on the easement, um, the grantees, grantee. right? And, and, and I would, I would, I would, I would venture to say that it applies to both the grantor and the grantee. But this is just talking about the the use of the easement. It says which setting grantor and grantees agree shall be preserved. The natural setting. Correct. So we're saying that the natural setting doesn't include a boulder wall. Is that what the Murphys are arguing? Uh, yes, and and again, I don't want to keep belaboring the point, but I think what the Murphys have contended all along, and it's been in all our findings, is, is not just with respect to the work that, that's being performed, it's also with respect to, again, the, the fact that the, the process wasn't followed, uh, plans that were submitted and resubmitted continue to provide inaccurate information, and this was, and a, and a, a blind eye was turned. Um, and if, and if, and if you know, and if that's, you know, if that's going to be okay, that's certainly that's up for you, you folks to determine this evening. But we would submit to you that that's not okay. So in our packet, we have a diagram, and it's somewhat unclear to me which party this came from, the Murphy, Murphys or the Livingstons. Um, can you provide me any direction as to which party this one originated with? I assume it's the Livingstons. That was the Livingston. Is that correct? Right. So... It seems to me that what's before us right now is the application and the granting of the application. And if this was the diagram that went with the application, I believe? The initial application, correct. So, so the application itself indicates to me, looking at it, that the Livingstons have said, we are going to build a border, a wall along the boundary. We are not going to go over the boundary. So if the issue that's being addressed right now is have they gone over the boundary, that seems to be beyond the actual permit and its app the application and the granting of the permit. That, that's correct. That's what we've been maintaining all along. Right. Not so much how, how it impacts the Murphys and, and things of like that. So, so it seems like the issue right now is not was it as built over the line. Let's, it seems like we should be approaching this issue as the permit granted the ability to build it on the Livingston side of the line as depicted here? Uh, yes, except there's a, many deficiencies with respect to the site plan, but yes, I would agree, I would agree with that. So, so to the extent that I granted uh, uh, a permit to build a structure and I build it on my neighbor's property, it seems like the, the avenue in that instance for the neighbor to proceed is not to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals, but to instead take it to a district court or, or some other venue, not the Board of Appeals? Uh, that I would disagree with. Um, certainly the, uh, the, 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 the Zoning Board of Appeals, at least in the town of Cape Elizabeth, has, has the power to uh, revoke a permit, uh, issue a stop work order to correct. If the uh, permit correct. completely properly granted in all that's happened. So say I don't even have a permit, I go in and build a structure on my neighbor's property. The Board of Zoning Appeals doesn't seem like the proper body to deal with that type of issue. The, again, if you and didn't have a permit and you're building on somebody else's property, uh, then it would be a couple different issues. But yes, the Zoning Board of Appeals would also, you know, again, could uh, invoke a fine. That in that instance, they're not even getting a permit. So it seems to me that what you're getting at is that it's not really, it's not truly the ZBA's jurisdiction to look at questions of title. I mean, we look at for a prima facie evidence of t right title and interest, and we do not look to settle quiet title actions. But I think that's exactly right. So what, what I think would be useful to me would to be, be to focus on, it seems like there's a couple issues here. The first issue is, and this is, seems to be the main issue, is where is the, the high water, or the, where is the, the boundary for measuring what the setback is? And one side is saying that the, the measurement location is the cliff, the other is saying that it's down past the cliff into the boulder area at some location. So that seems to be the first issue. And, and we have to reach a conclusion as to where that line lies. And if the line is where the Livingstons say it is, then it seems that the Murphys would agree that the patio and the boulder wall, at least for purposes of the setback, neither of those would be within the 75-foot uh, distance if the Livingstons are correct as to where the line is. If the, if the board finds that the Livingstons are correct. Right, so, so that will be dispositive as to whether 
Um, I think what the issue is, I think the first issue is whether or not it's a non-conforming structure. Correct. And so there's, that's one piece of that, correct. And then is, it sounded like you were also saying that the Murphy's position is another issue on appeal is whether the lot coverage has been exceeded? Correct. So that issue we also need to reach irrespective of whether it's non-conforming or not. Non-conforming with respect to the setback. Uh, that's a, a separate issue which determines whether or not the the work that's going to be performed is it's, it's a non-conforming structure, all of it. Okay. So it, it seems like we've heard uh, via the, the filings we've received and then also to this, the discussion and then also the site, uh, site walk a good amount as to what the characteristics are there and uh, on the location as to where the, the watermark is and we've been able to view that with our own eyes. So I, I personally feel like I've received enough information to it reach uh, to reach a decision on that. I don't know how the rest of the board feels. Do we feel like we want to put that at least to rest and move on? I think we should let Mr. Uh, Schumadine yep. be heard on it to the extent he wants to. Definitely. I'd be curious too about whether um, when this, uh, this building permit was granted, whether there was any um, concession on your part regarding whether the, the structures are or are not non-conforming. I want to answer your question, but I also feel more than a little confused by their argument because I don't see that there is an argument. They seem to present a whole bunch of stuff to you, none of which really amounts to anything in terms of the permit not being allowed. Uh, you know, is the structure non-conforming or not? Have we conceded that? I don't think we have. I certainly don't think we have. I also think, though, that it's pretty much irrelevant to this discussion. What we are doing is we're removing impermeable surface from the property and then regrading and putting in impermeable. impermeable. Did I say something different? I meant impermeable. We are removing impermeable surface from the, from the property and then we are regrading and seeding and putting in a retaining wall after having done that. Now as far as the retaining wall is concerned, I think the point is, is that the, the permit shows that it's outside of the right-of-way. That's what was approved, and I have a survey plan showing that it is outside of the retaining wall. We've heard, oh, outside. I mean, outside of the, right. God, right. <laughs> outside of the right-of-way. We've heard them say it isn't. I don't think they have anyone here who can say that it, it is in the right-of-way, and I've got an expert here who can testify that it's outside. Okay, we don't have that survey, correct? I believe you do. I know it was presented to the town, and I have a. I don't know where to put it quite, but I have a blow up, and this was prepared by Northeast Civil Solutions, and I have someone who can talk about that, but. They found the boundary of the right-of-way, and they showed that the, the retaining wall is outside of that right-of-way. But ultimately, that issue is really irrelevant to this appeal. Whether this thing is inside or outside of the right-of-way doesn't matter here, because what's before you is what was approved. What was approved is a retaining wall that is outside of the right-of-way. So that's what the living since were required to build. To the extent that they don't think that happened, the correct avenue is, and to the extent that they can convince the town, which would be through the code enforcement office, that, it, that that is correct, the correct avenue is for an enforcement action. Because then what they're alleging is, not that the permit is invalid, but that the permit has been violated. Our permit says, retaining wall outside of right of way. We've built it that way. I have evidence showing you that we've built it that way. Pass that around. What? Can you pass it around? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Oh, do we have that? No, I'm not sure it's the same. No, it's not the same. It is. Thank you.
So is this a survey? It's an existing conditions plan, so it's created by a surveyor. Does that make it a survey? I would say that it does. I mean, they're, they're, it's, not, it's certainly not a, uh, I mean, there are different types of surveys. You have uh, existing conditions plans, you have standard boundary surveys, you have all sorts of things. This is created by a surveyor, and if you want, I can have someone testify as to how it was created. But again, I don't think the issue before you is whether or not that retaining wall is or is outside of the right-of-way, because under the permit, it's supposed to be outside of it. And to the extent it is not, that is an issue for enforcement, or it's an issue for a private action. This shows the original retaining wall before the work was done. No. No, that's the existing conditions as is. As if you went out we saw it several weeks okay. ago. If you went out on the property, that's what you saw. The um, seventy five uh, shoreland zone that's shown on that, is that based on state shoreland zone or Cape of Elizabeth? Cape Elizabeth. And based on what? Where does, where does the measure start? Is mean it the high, high water, mean high? high. And, and how is that? How is that? Looks like it's from highest annual tide. And how did you, how, how did you reach the determination as to what the highest annual tide is? I mean, obviously, I think we're going at the definition of the natural, normal. High I understand. High. I, I'm, I'm just, I mean, people are looking at the, sure. the plan, so I want to make sure that everyone. All right, now, before I go into the, the you asked, asked actually a question about the normal, how the high water line is, is created. And that's actually a mixed question of fact and law. There's a legal part of it, and there's a factual part of it. I have so next someone here who can testify as to the factual part of it, and I'll bring him up in a second. But first, I want to talk about the legal part of it. Now, I'd rather not just sort of talk in the air about what this stuff is, but let's look at the ordinance and what the ordinance actually says. If you look at the uh, shoreland zone, it says that it's a 75 foot uh, buffer or setback. Um, actually, it's called a setback in the ordinance. From the normal high water line of other water bodies and tributary streams. Can you give us a section? Yeah, that is this is your shoreland zoning overlay district, which is 19-6-11. It is the uh, chart that's in it. And on the second page of that chart or table. Number three, normal high water line of other water bodies and tributary streams, which is what applies here, because it's not a great pond uh, and not in the other district. So it is 75 feet from the normal high water line of other water bodies. Okay? Now we need to know what is the normal high water line of other water bodies. Look to the definition section. The definition section. is 19.1-1-3. And about midway through, you come to normal high water line of coastal waters. <coughs> and that reads, that line on the shore of tidal waters, which is the apparent extreme limit of the effects of the tides, i.e. the top of the bank, cliff, or beach above high tide. The active language there is the apparent extreme limit of the effects of the tide, not top of the bank, 
top of the cliff for anything else. Those are examples. And in fact, the law court has addressed this issue and reached the same conclusion. Top of the bank is not mandatory. It is just an example. And I think the same thing is true of your saltwater vegetation. That's an example of what could show, possibly, the extreme limits of the effect of the tide. But the important thing here is the, impar the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tide. Now, there are three ways of doing that. One is through uh, establishing visual means, and another is through establishing elevations. And I think that you have something in your packet from Bruce Smith saying that he didn't do the visual means, and that instead he went with the elevation. And I'll have my expert come up here and tell you about the elevation and how he came to do that. But I think the important point of this, I have two, two important points before I bring them up. Mr. Schumann, you can stop here for a moment. Sir, you'll have your chance, OK? It speaks directly to the definition in a separate part of the order. After, after, after he's done, sir. OK. The first is, is that I think to determine where the normal apparent high water effect of the, the limits of the tide is, I think you really need an expert. But I also think to show that some place is not that location, you don't necessarily need an expert. And I think anyone who went out there could see that if the water ever reached the top of the bank, Cape Elizabeth would have huge problems. Because I suggest that a good portion of Broad Cove would be underwater. The water just never reaches there. And I think that that's apparent. So it cannot possibly be that the extreme limit of the effects of the tides is where they say it is, because the tide just doesn't reach there. And when you're there, you can see some staining that's well down the cliff and very close to the location where the Livingston's expert has set the location of this line. So I think that they don't have really any evidence to dispute that. But I want my expert to come up here. Um, Jim, this is Jim Fisher, who is the owner of Northeast Civil Solutions. And if he could just I'll have him give, give his qualifications and then talk a little bit about how he came up to that line. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Jim Fisher with Northeast Civil Solutions. We are a survey licensed, uh, main licensed, New Hampshire licensed um, surveying and engineering firm, um, able to work uh, with surveying and engineering throughout uh, New England. Actually, we're licensed throughout all the New England states. As far as the datum is concerned, there are various types of datum, that, uh, vertical datums, that anybody can use when you're looking at trying to determine an actual elevation. These are all predicated on various elevations based on the uh, NOAA, which is the uh, um, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, they, along with FEMA, that has a separate set of dam datum. The U.S. Geological Survey has a separate set of datum. The datum that is accepted by both the Department of Environmental Protection, as far as the state is concerned, and the, the town of Cape Elizabeth is the vertical datum that is set by either NGVD-29 or NAVD-88. Uh, That's national um, uh, North Atlantic vertical datum. Point being is that you can have separate, you can have different numbers, but the, the base of the datum is exactly the same. In other words, if the ocean were completely flat, at any given time, you've got a specific surface, level playing surface. You can have different datums that are actually attached to that based on what the up and down or the, the uh, elevations go from there. You can go down, you can go below sea level, you can go above sea level. In this particular case, the uh, NAVD88 uh, datum is what was used. We ended up doing this uh, according to the, uh, this meaning uh, providing the elevations and putting them on the plan. This is according to the highest annual tide. Um, I would point out that the initial plan that we did um, was mislabeled. That was based on the flood elevation data or the mean high tide levels. That was based on flood data. Um, the mathematics that we used to be able to determine the topography of the elevations out there is exactly the same. So the plans that you've got before you, nothing has changed mathematically. It was just a matter of semantics. That is actually the highest annual tide. And that is predicated on an actual elevation, a topographic elevation. How we do that is uh, you can, surveyors in general or anybody in general can actually use the, um, the vertical data from a GPS unit uh, or you can actually use lasers. GPS is getting a lot better, but it's still not great, especially where elevations are concerned. Uh, horizontally, it's a little bit better. We didn't use GPS in this particular case. Uh, we used actually the laser instruments. And what that means is we tied into a known point, an accepted point, uh, according to U.S. Uh, Geological Survey and NOAA, uh, established by both with a particular datum, an elevation datum that's on it, relative to the NAVD-88. 
we brought that by a laser instrument, and I say laser instrument because it's exceptionally accurate as far as its measurements are concerned, to this actual site from those reference points. From that point, from that site point, we then li literally went over the hill. And because the elevations are predicated on a specific point, in this case 6.5 feet NAVD, we are looking for the elevations of 6.5 feet on that cliff face. Fortunately, it's not a vertical cliff, although as you saw when you were out there, it's, it gets relatively close in some cases. So we blanketed the entire area that is, I'll call it the front or the ocean side of this property, um, from beyond both property, an extension of both property lines, and went all the way across that cliff, establishing the 6.5 elevation. Now that doesn't mean we're actually reading 6.5 at the time we're doing it. We are going, establishing a grid and from that, all those elevation shots, we take that information back to uh, our office with the software that we have that allows us to show where any given point is on the face of the earth from an elevation standpoint. So we are able to establish with the little ins and outs that go across that cliff face where exactly the 6.5 line is. From that point, we offset that at 75 feet. That is the setback within the shoreland zone from highest annual tide. That is what is shown on the plan. None of that has changed, so other than the... Are, are you, uh, go ahead. Th that's highest annual tide. That's correct, highest annual tide, HAT. It, it, that was mislabeled that, initially. That, is that where basically, and just from a layperson's perspective, is that where the tide rises to, just if it's not, if there's not a lot of surf and waves, is that where the tide rises to that would be, at that point? Yes, that's the level. This is not storm tides. This okay. is the highest annual tide that's typically the spring equinox. But it, it, this wouldn't account for a storm tide or if, if, if it's a full no, moon. No, it doesn't account for wave action. I mean, you could have you know, tsunamis and, and large storm tides or what have you that could be considerably greater than that. And if I can interject, the, the standard is normal high water line. It's not storm line. or Well, well I know, but I'm looking at the definition, which says the apparent extreme limit of the effects of the tide. Which right, but I think what different. you're look, looking for is the extreme effect of the normal tide. If a, a tsunami comes in, that doesn't all of a sudden raise the, the, the effects of the, 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 the high water mark to wherever that location is. You're looking well, at the... I, I understand that, but, but I, I don't think we're even talking about a tsunami. I think we were just talking about a storm tide could be higher than that normal high tide. Although I think, your, I, I think your point is that a storm tide, tide already takes it outside of the, the effects of a normal tide. And that Normal That's exactly the point that I'm making. Yeah. What needs to be read in here, which I don't oh. know if I agree with you or not on that, but sure, that's your position. Mr. It, oh, go ahead. No, sorry. Uh, so are, are you aware that we received, or part of the record, is a letter from Mike Morse of the Maine DEP? Or, have you seen that? Um, I haven't seen Mike's letter, but I was out there with Mike Morse when we were out there at the site. So as to he, he indicated that he believed that the reconstructed deck was located approximately 50 feet from the shoreline. Um, did he? The deck is part the deck. of the permit. But I, I want to use that to determine if uh, Mike Morse's definition of shoreline matches the uh, that line on the shore of tidal waters that would match the normal high water line. Uh, did you define the normal high water line as the point that he defined as the shoreline, or are they different locations? Do you? Well, I can't speak for specific, specifically for him, but when we were there, we explained to him how we did what we I mean, Mike, we deal with the DEP and Mike Moores all the time, and we explained to him how we got the information that we got and, put, and showed on that plan, and he was in complete agreement with that. So is his statement that he evaluated the location of the reconstructed deck and it was determined to be 50 feet from the shoreline? That is in reference to the line that you explained to him was your position as to what the normal high water line? As far as the, the when we're talking about the shoreline, yes, I, I can't speak for him as far as the distances that he's interpreting as far as the decks are concerned, but uh, the shoreline I'm not sure is that's right. correct. Um, I, I think I'm looking at your survey, Northeast Civil Solutions, right? It's attached to... I think that's the, the, old, the outdated it's one. It's attached to the October 16th letter. The one I'm looking at is attached to... Um, Look at the date. On the oh, okay. October 3rd. Yeah, it's, it's dated October 3rd. Yes. Okay. And, and the one I'm looking at was attached actually to the, to the Taylor McCormick and Frame letter of October 16th. And on this, it looks as though you're, you're asserting that the, hot, that the highest annual tide level, um, that the distance from that to the shoreline is 75 feet. I'm reading this right. 
I'm not sure I understand your question. Where it, where it says the uh, see where it says highest annual tide, yeah, which is the actual ocean area. This is not where the tide is today. This is uh, getting to your question, but this is actually the HAT is typically the spring equinox tide. So, and then there's data, there's daily data, actually there's multiple daily data that we can extrapolate from there. But this is the highest line where the tide actually gets. On the left there, you have a call out for 75 feet. Yes. What is that going to, that dosh, line, dot, line, dot, line? What, is that, what does that signify there? Yes. That's the setback. That's the uniform 75 foot setback from the 6.5 elevation, which establishes that HAT. Okay. Okay. Not to be confused with the, with the quote unquote high bank that we. No, that has nothing okay. to do with that. It's no just problem. a setback line. Okay. okay. Thanks. Can I ask a question about the DEP memo too? Um, on that memo, it says that there were actual measurements taken on site by DEP staff, which revealed that the house fully conforms to the minimum shoreline setback requirement, regardless of some historic error on site plans, and therefore the structure is conforming. And my question is whether, when I was looking at the survey, which I don't have in front of me right now, it looks like a portion of the house came out significantly beyond the patio towards that setback. And I wanted to be sure, A, that that's the portion of the house they're looking at, the closer portion, yes? Yes. And B, that were there any measurements of the boulder wall or the new retaining wall while he was out there? Was that looked at at all to confirm its location? You mean this wall right here? Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, when I was there, no, that wasn't there yet. Okay. If he's been out there since that time, I can't speak for him. Okay. And but I, I can tell you for what it's worth that the, uh, um, he actually, to Mike actually took, Mike, by the way, is, for those of you who may not know, works with the DEP, and he is the shoreland zoning expert um, at the DEP. Uh, when we were there with him, uh, he actually pulled the distance, uh, pulled by, meaning he used a tape, a fiberglass tape, from this point toward the top of the bank, and the 75 feet from that particular, using this as the beginning and pulling toward the water, um, he did not get actually beyond the grass area. He didn't get down over the bank. At that point, that's when he established, although he didn't have any uh, information like we do with the level of accuracy, but that's when he established that there was no issue as far as that's concerned. Because as somebody stated, the water level is actually about another 40 feet beyond that, the highest annual tide level. So from work that you do elsewhere um, with DEP and with other towns, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, that this definite, the CAPE definition of normal high water line of coastal waters being that line on the shore of tidal waters, which is the apparent extreme limit of the effects of the tides, is relatively consistent with other ordinances, including the state shoreland model ordinance? Yes, the ordinance language is, I wouldn't say exactly the same, because different towns have different wordings, but uh, yes, it is essentially all the same, and most of the coastal communities hold to that uh, definition. And is that generally for DEP purposes and in other municipalities, the HHT that you're showing on this plan? And for, it goes beyond that. It goes to FEMA and USGS. But yes, that is generally uniformly accepted. Can, can I go back? I, I, I don't know if we're done with, I well, want to go back to the legal issue. Well, yeah, we, but, we can stay up here and uh, we'll, we'll answer the questions as they. And, and I, I, I mean, I hate to dive into a case, but the, um, the letter that Attorney Tereski submitted uh, earlier today um, cited this case, which, which I think you've been referring to, which uh, addresses the, the language in the north right, of the water, the I, IE. I have not seen the letter that you're referring to. Let me, let me just, so the case is, is Mac versus right. town of Cape Elizabeth. And um, at the end of that decision, this is from 1983, and they're talking about the the, the language of the normal high water line of coastal waters and the last paragraph of that before the conclusion is nevertheless the board properly interpreted the definition of normal high water mark by taking into account the effect of the tides beyond the high tide level of the water itself the ordinance specifically refers to the extreme limit of the effects of the tide the definition of normal high water mark also includes the top of the bank cliff or beach above the high tide thus the ordinance contemplates some terrain above the high tide level that is still within the effect of the tides. So I'm just interested in your response and reaction to that. I think you need to look at the previous paragraph too. Because the previous paragraph ends, the definition of normal high watermark begins with the general definition, and then it quotes the language, and ends with what are obviously intended to be three examples. I think that the question that you've asked and I don't want to, I, mean, I think it's a good question, but I also think it's somewhat irrelevant to the, to the issues you're facing today. 
Because what the, the Murphys have argued here is that it is a bright line rule, top of the bank. That's what your definition is, that's what it is, that's what it has to be, top of the bank, period. And that's not what the ordinance says. The ordinance says it's the apparent extreme limit of the effects of the tide. Now what we've established is a high water mark, and I'll let Jim talk in a second about it, but my understanding of the high water mark is that it is effectively taking into account the types of actions that you're talking about there, the extreme, the, the effects of the tide beyond just simply where, where a sort of level of water line. But I, what I'll, I'll say as well is from a, from a practical standpoint, anyone who went out there and saw that cliff, it is a cliff. It goes pretty vertical. If we are talking about, if you, you even, to, even, and I think that what Jim did was the right way, and I think legally it's correct, and I think it's, it's unassailable. Even if you were not, you were to say, well, it may be some bit beyond that. It's not very much beyond that, because there's nowhere for the water to go but straight up. And as we all know, water, to, water rises a level, it doesn't start scaling walls. Um, and the only way this gets to the top of the bank is if the water level rises tens of feet. Because one thing I think is worth noting about this plan is that we have an elevation here of 6.5. The elevation there is 39. Now granted it slopes down to here, but it does not slope down 39 feet or even 32 feet. There is a significant amount of elevation between the 6.5 location and where they say the, the tide is. And there is no evidence, and they have provided no evidence whatsoever, to show that the tide is anywhere other than where Jim says it is. Now, I want Jim to talk, if, if it's all right, about, I mean, you, you're talking about where the high tide mark is. And I think I'd like to, Jim to talk about how the high, annual high tide, or the hat, highest annual tide takes that into account, if, it, if you understand that. Um, as, far as, a, uh, as far as the cliff face is concerned, the, the interesting thing, the nice thing about, uh, about surveying as far as establishing uh, elevations, for instance, it's, it's based on mathematics. There's no art to it. It's, it's a science. And the science that is accepted and uh, displayed or, or described in the regulations for both the state and the municipality are all predicated on that one particular line. You can't have, uh, again, this is, I leave this to the lawyers, but you typically can't have one property that's got a higher elevation than another property based on an even sea level. This is why there's an actual even elevation line that is set by NOAA in certain segments as it goes up the coast or down the coast, as the case may be, on any coast throughout the world. Uh, in this case, the eastern coast of the United States. So this datum, again, is predicated on a specific level. Now, how does that account for anything, any portions of the cliff that are above that? And this is a little subjective, but typically, because you've got that mathematical uniform line off of which everything is based for highest annual tides, anything that's above that on a cliff face is typically there from erosion. The steeper the cliff, the less likely it is that you're going to have uh, any type of flora that's actually going to grow there, any type of flora at all, whether it's saltwater tolerant or not. The other issue, and I can say this as an Army Corps of Engineers certified uh, wetlands delineation expert, is that saltwater vegetation is not limited specifically to the exact lines of the coast. You can have saltwater vegetation, particularly in the conditions that we have in Maine, immediately adjacent to the coast, um, where you've got a lot of fog and uh, moisture that is blowing in from the, from the saltwater tolerant areas. You can have saltwater vegetation, tolerant vegetation that is far inland, well away from the coast. That itself, it is an indicator, but it is not the indicator. You can also have um, certain elevations and eroded cliffs that are going to, somebody could say, well, you've got tidal action. Well, to a certain extent, they're absolutely correct. But to another extent, depending on the steepness of that cliff, you're going to have erosion from simple storm water. Now, does that take into account extreme events? Yes, it does. That's why the mathematical elevation is set at a certain level. This is what the actual highest annual tide will get to at this particular elevation, no matter where you are in this particular quadrant of the main coast. 
Anything above that, is that to say you're not going to get spray? No, during salt uh, or, or storm tides, you could certainly get spray. But that has nothing to do with the actual tidal elevations themselves. Those are storm tides. So I, I think what some of the, my fellow board members have touched on um, is that th there's two uh, parts to this definition. The first is tides. Is it a storm tide? Is it a normal tide? And the second is that the definition itself seems to go beyond merely the tide line. It goes to the effects of the tide. So are you saying that in defining the, 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 um, the normal high water line, there's where the water physically goes to, but then it's actually defined beyond that because that's where the spray <coughs> goes to? Or it, does your definition not take, or your your point not take into account the location where the effects extend to of let's take a, a normal tide as opposed to a storm tide. No, we certainly have the effects of the normal tide and the actual highest annual tide. But that, 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 ex, that is at a point beyond where you measured from? Or did you measure from where the effects end of the normal high tide? Well, that's somewhat subjective, I would submit. I mean, where, how do you know what the effects are? Is that salt spray on your window? That's if you're the language in our away. definition um, is effects. So, and, and that's fine, but again, that's a subjective interpretation. Somebody could say, well, this is an effect of a tide, and somebody else could say, no, it's not. So your measurement is from where the, the, the high tide ends, not the end of where the effects. The highest annual tide line is where the measurement ends or starts, depending on how you're looking at it. Would a, kind of changing subject a little bit, would a per building permit have been required for just the um, retaining wall or boulder wall, whatever you want to call it? Um, that's more a question, again, for the municipal codes officer. I'm, I'm not sure that permits typically are required for landscaping issues. Um, it, and usually the, uh, the rule for retaining walls is if you've got something that is holding back a certain amount of pressure, um, and that's subjective as well, but generally speaking, if it's you know, four or five feet tall and it's got um, no pressure on one side and extreme pressure on the other, that's about as high as you would get beyond which you would need site plan approval to be able to say this is actually going to hold up the way it's supposed to. I guess the origin of my question is that it seems like regardless of whether we measure the um, from the top of the bank or the HHT or whatever it is, um, the patio is outside either of those measures based on what I'm hearing from you I, and what we're seeing on the I, plan. I think the Murphys disagree with that. Yeah. But there's no evidence in the record that indicates that the patio by the house is inside 75 feet from the top of the bank. I, I, I don't want to speak for them. I think they disagree with that. My answer to that, though, would be that the top of the bank, under no, def, no possible reading of this definition, is the top of the bank the actual location of the extreme limits of the effects of the tide because you're looking at something that is vertically so far away from this 6.5 elevation that it's, it's simply impossible for that to be the extreme limits of the effects of the tide. Of course, I think the 6.5 is the one that you need to hold, but... but so, sorry. Uh, Am I also correct that even assuming that both the patio and the wall are within the 75-foot shoreland overlay zone, that all that would have been required is that the application come from the code enforcement officer to us for us to determine whether those, they wouldn't have been prohibited, those structures, we'd just have to say yes or no, this is set back as much as possible. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm really, uh, attorney, I know Attorney Duchette has, has argued that. Uh, I don't understand why he argues that, uh, because what we are doing, I mean, first of all, you've got to assume that the house is non-conforming, so that's the 75 foot. So the retaining wall, though, is not, a, not an alteration of the, it's a retaining wall. It's not really part of an alteration of the, of the, of the structure, so that doesn't really fall under those, those standards. You're saying that the retaining wall itself is not a structure? I don't think that, it, that it's certainly not a part of the, the non, I mean, I'm just not sure how he sees that we get to the ZBA. It seems to me that it's still just a building permit because we're not altering, not, at least not falling under the, the non-conforming buildings and structures portions, which talk about 
enlargement, relocation, reconstruction, replacement, change in use. So you would say that shrinking a patio is not an enlargement or a relocation? But isn't it a reconstruction? No, I, wouldn't, I would say that it's not. I mean, I mean the, the, the reality is here that at the end of the day, despite all of their arguments, even if we assume that they're all true, what has effectively happened here is that the Livingstons have made their property more conforming. So it may not be completely, it may still be non-conforming, mean, and, and I don't know about the whole lot coverage thing. So the, the, the shoreland zone and the protection of the water, the entire idea, from my perspective at least, is that we have all these structures in the state of Maine that are built from some perspective too close to the water. We don't want to go to every single property owner and say, you have to knock this down and move it out in, outside of this buffer. What we're going to allow you to do is continue to have your structures within that buffer, but we don't want you to increase its size. We don't want you to rebuild it. We don't want you to continue to, uh, to improve upon it. We're going to let you keep it. But if anything happens, we're going to make you move it out unless it's not feasible to, keep, to, to locate it outside of the buffer. That, that's my perspective of what's going on with this ordinance. So what the ordinance says is basically, hey, if you're enlarging, uh, relocating, a non-conforming structure, you have to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals and you have to get them to say, yeah, you know, it's not feasible to locate this outside of the buffer, we're going to allow you to relocate it. But otherwise, the idea is that slowly over time, we're going to be removing these non-conforming structures from the buffer. And I think that's, exa I mean, and that's exactly right, but we aren't relocating, it's staying in the same location. We're reducing it, we're making it more, more it's, if it, to the extent that it is in fact non-conforming, which I don't agree with, we have made it more conforming because we have reduced, they, they complain about the lot area, the lot coverage. Of but the surface. ordinance doesn't contemplate the, the concept of making things more conforming but keeping them in. And I understand the argument for why, why it should perhaps allow you to make things more conforming. The idea from my perspective from the ordinance is eventually these things are going to run down, They're, things are going to happen, people are going to want to replace them or remove them. And at that point, we're not allowing them to be replaced. If, if it's torn out, it goes away. Well, I, I think that, that, well, I mean, we would, we would have an, uh, I think though that, that, that I, I think you're missing what, what the issue really, or I'm, I, I apologize, I'm not. And I understand we don't reach this issue if this isn't within the, the setback. Right, but I think the, the other thing is, is and, and the point that I was trying to make is that if Attorney Duchette says that it's got to come to you, he needs to point to something that says it has to come to you. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the starting point from an enlargement is that a non-conforming structure may be added to or expanded after attaining a building permit from the code enforcement officer. That's a built permit from the code enforcement officer. And then there are other rules that talk about if you're doing more or, or, or less, you know. Provided that such addition or expansion does not increase the non-conformity of the structure. Yeah, which ours does not. For the, certainly for the patio, it decreases the non-conformity. It, it decreases. the wall? I would say that that's that. that, that is neither an increase or decrease. It's, it's simply a retaining structure, which I think is, is or a retaining wall. It's not really a part of the underlying structure. It doesn't, uh, you know, it's an erosion control measure. It's not really a uh, change in the structure. Structure is defined as anything built for the support, shelter, or enclosure of persons, animals, goods, or property of any kind. I think, though, that it's an allowed use in the, in the, in the zone. The, the retaining wall, you're allowed to, to build walls, retaining walls in the zone in order to prohibit the remo or to prevent the erosion of uh, your property. Is it a permitted use? I believe it is. I mean, isn't, isn't what the Livingtons have done a reconstruction? I mean, it doesn't fit in. It's not, it's not a, an enlargement. It's not a relocation, but I mean, patio. would it or would it not be a reconstruction? The patio and the retaining wall, if it's within the 75 foot setback. Because any non conforming structure which fails to meet the required setback from a water body, tributary, stream, or wetland, and which is damaged or destroyed regardless of the cause, it wasn't the patio destroyed? By a permit. I mean, it was, it was removed by a permit and replaced in a smaller, smaller location. I mean, basically, this is what I do not understand, is that 
I think that if they're, they're going to say it has to come before the ZBA, I think they need to argue what it falls under to say that it has to come before the ZBA. I don't think they can just say, well, it's got to come before the ZBA without giving an actual... That, that's bar. indicated in the Murphy's initial appeal. They cite the section 19.92 with respect to that this requires site plan review. And, of course, we don't reach any of this if we determine that the, the water line is such that this is not within the 75 foot. Can I ask one further question on the water line? Because I think we're, we're, we're getting caught up in the setback, right? That's the threshold. So I think many of us were at this site inspection we went to a few weeks ago. And I think uh, it was clear to me, I, I, I guess this is a question maybe for, for is it Mr. Fisher? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I'm staring at your, your survey. And, I'm, and in my mind, I have what, what I view to be um, the, uh, the high water mark or the normal water line, if you will, that I saw visually from standing on the rocks. It was down the cliff. You know, I, I couldn't tell you the feet. But my question, I guess, is for you is I'm staring at this. We've got two measurements, one at 75 feet and at another at 109 feet, which is at the, the point of the nearest point of the, of the house, it looks like. And, and my question is, do you have any idea whether your measurement is, is at or about where uh, many of us saw the standing on the rocks, um, where it looks to be where the, the high water mark is more often than not? I would believe it is, but I don't know what you were looking at. And, and keeping in mind that the highest annual tide is the spring equinox tide, which is pretty high. I don't know if you were out there at high tide or low tide. Um, we were about an hour away from high tide. Okay, then yes. Generally, given that that face, uh, the rock face is more vertical than it is horizontal, it was pretty darn close to where the highest annual tide would typically be. What that underlying zone is? The underlying zone, I believe, is residential uh, or a All right. one, I believe. So it makes sense. Um, Mr. Soretsky is here, I believe, on a different case, but one of his primary arguments has to do with the same issue. To allow him to, to comment now, it seems to me that we're going to make a decision one way or the other as it pertains to this to this appeal, and it's going to be real hard not to apply that to that appeal as well. So um, if uh, Attorney Soretsky is here, he's, or Toretsky, I'm sorry, he's, uh, he's welcome to come up and be heard. I don't know if he is here or not. They're caucusing in the back. Sir, if you're going to talk, we're going to need to have you come up to the... And sir, this, this is just as to the issue of the... Of the I understand. Uh, I'm Marshall Goldman, 27 Pilot Point Road. Uh, we have here uh, our attorney, uh, David Tureski, and we have our landscape architect, John Mitchell. And uh, don't know, John... Do you want to, are, are you willing to shed some light on some of these issues? He would be the expert uh, in, in this case, if you'd like to answer, for him to ask any questions regarding this matter. Or we're happy to wait, whichever, whichever is the pleasure of the uh, zoning board. And, and these guys, you may not want that. Sure, please. We don't want to do anything that is going to, you know, be out of order. It seems to me, I, I understand what you're saying, but it seems to me that these two appeals have to rise and fall on their own merits. And so, I mean, I think the Murphys have to provide whatever evidence they're going to provide, and I don't think they've provided it. I, I mean, I don't know what this, this person's going to say, and that, you know, that's fine, but uh, I don't really think that, that commingling the two things together. I understand where you're saying that, but I, I don't. I, th I think we object to that. I think we would rather have them have them done separately, and each one 
rise and fall on its own merits. Um, that's. I personally think that at the end of the day, the decision turns on the definition of the normal high water line of coastal waters. And for me, that turns on how do we define tides and how do we define effect. And that then, for me at least, is dispositive of the entire issue. And I don't disagree with you, but I think. And I don't, yeah, I guess I don't know if I need any additional information. I think Attorney Schumadine has a point regarding commingling of the records on the two. I mean, to the extent this were to go to court, we certainly want, would want the record to be clear with regard to what came in on which appeal. Yep. I agree with that. I, I mean, part of that, too, is that I don't want to create issues on appeal, I mean, on appeal as well. I, that's, that's kind of my concern. Okay. Um, why don't we just to make it official when we, okay. when we take a vote on it? No, uh, no problem. Uh, all in favor of um, having <laughs> Mr. Goldman and his representatives um, testify only during their their uh, appeal. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Then, sir. Uh, George Foley. Um, I don't know if it helps. Um, I specifically asked this question of Maureen, your town planner, and she assured me that she wrote the ordinance and she accidentally removed top of the bank from the ordinance and was told that she had to put it back in, which she did, and that's the approved ordinance that stands out there. She said there was a case on it that said it was the top of the bank, and she said in Cape Elizabeth, it is the top of the bank. And so, I mean, I specifically asked her this question, where do we measure from? Your own town planner said this is where it is in Cape Elizabeth. So, and I think other cases it's been the same. I think that's the Mac case that you referenced, mm -hmm. most likely? Yeah, but I don't... I don't think the Mac case held that it was measured from the top of the bank. Understandable. I also spoke with the town manager and Maureen, and they both confirmed that in Cape Elizabeth, the top of the bank is the starting point of the coastal wetland setback and the 250-foot shoreland zone. And I've got some information. But I, I guess my concern with all of this evidence that we're getting regarding whether it is or is not the top of the bank is that I don't have any plan that shows me what on the property is within 75 feet of top of the bank. Yeah, and norm we normally anything that is, we, we need to have it in the record in order to be able to consider it. <laughs> and, and a minimum, you should, the, the, the Livingston Council should have. I'm going to object to admission. I mean, it needs to be admitted tonight unless you don't reach a decision tonight, which God forbid. <laughs> and it needs to be in some form that can actually be put into the record. And to the extent it's not, then I object to, to the board considering it. tell you that from the top of the bank if you measure this is this corner is 50 feet from the top of the bank 75 feet gets you into the existing patio based on what based on measuring from the top of the bank a horizontal Have you personally done that? yes does does that I measured it on August 1st with Bruce present my husband um, and Bob Van Wert the builder be at a meeting that Bruce set up. We measured this 50 feet to the top of the bank from this corner. 
So if you go 75 feet, we also measured that. And when we went out on the site... The top of the bank as established by... The top of the bank as established by the top of the bank. Looking at the... By your visual the, observations? Looking at the Goldman's site plan, the abutting property when they did their home. Um, the top of the bank is... The problem is we have location. a letter from Mike Morse of the DEP who says right. that his measurement... Uh, yes, okay. but yeah. every municipality can have, they must have at least those minimal standards, mm -hmm. but they can have, and many do, and CAPE does, a more restrictive standard. Um, so I wanted to just read, in Coastal Wetlands and the DEP, um, it's a DEP information sheet establishing the starting point for measuring of the shoreland zone and related setback determinations. And I'll, would you like it before I read it, or is it, do you have it? We, we have a number of, can you just show us the, the, what it looks like uh, so we can see which one? I have enough copies. Would you just like one? We, we have a number of them already in the It so looks like this. What's it entitled? It's entitled DEP Information Sheet. Got it. Exhibit D1. Establishing the starting point for measurement of the shoreland zone and related setback determinations. When you look at page three and you look at coastal wetlands, you see several methods. You can do a visual inspection method. You can do the elevation method, which is what Mr. Fisher spoke about. And then down at the very end of this, it says, note, also, that where visual evidence such as the presence of salt-tolerant vegetation extends further inland than the measured tidal elevation, the line formed by the more restrictive criterion must be used. There is salt-tolerant vegetation at the top of that bank. And the documentation of that is your personal observation? It's, I've taken pictures of it and I've looked it up online. It's salt-tolerant vegetation. There are two forms of lichen there that can only live in salt-tolerant. So, so the, the one problem is that it, the, from my perspective, is salt-tolerant vegetation is not uh, completely dispositive of the issue. It is evidence that's indicative of where the line can be. For example, um, a number of towns, I think perhaps even Cape, will mention that if you're planting trees along the side of the road, you should plant salt-tolerant salt trees because of salt in the wintertime. So it's indicative, but it's not necessarily di dispositive when I look at this. But I, I do agree that it does provide some indication. Um. And I believe that the spray zone is part of the coastal wetland, the upland edge. Um, I also made copies of the zoning map because I think it helps to see the 250 foot setback. And as I said before, in talking with Mike McGovern and Maureen O'Mara, um, they said that the starting point in Cape Elizabeth is the top of the bank. And if you look at prior, um, even in our neighborhood, the West property, the Goldman property, it's at the top of the bank on a certified just to be clear, what this is showing is the 250 foot setback. That, right? Those little dots. It's 250 feet though, right? Not 75. Yeah. Um, and I think my husband can talk to the lot coverage um, because that is important. Um, impervious surface does count. 
and the boulder wall and stairs. It's not just a wall, but there's a significant section of stair. Creates more impervious surface on the lot. It, and before we go there, I don't know if the rest of the board, from, from my perspective, the, the setback will be, one way or the other, will be potentially will be dispositive as to the lot coverage issue. So in uh, the interest of time, do we want to try to reach a conclusion on the setback issue to determine whether we need to reach a lot coverage issue? Yes. Yes. So I, I don't... Briefly? Yes. Uh, the first thing I want to say is as to the contention that CAPE has adopted something that's more restrictive than any other ordinance, I don't think that that's accurate. And in fact, there's a Superior Court case called Nardi v. Town of Kennebunkport discussing the town of Kennebunkport's normal high water line that uses word for word the ex pretty much the exact same definition that CAPE uses. I think that's a standard one. I think that it's... Do you know if it includes the word extreme? Yeah. Uh, and then I, Jim wanted to say something about using the top, top of the bank. Um, just a uh, it's more of a point of information than anything else or perhaps a point of observation. When you're looking at top of bank, that becomes a very, very subjective uh, idea. Um, please keep in mind, too, I'm a disinterested party in this whole thing, but uh, when I look at this from a uh, mathematical or a scientific standpoint, when we've got a uniform uh, height of highest annual tide, that's something that is uniform up and down the particular coast. That's it. That's the line that we are, that's been established officially. If you're looking at top of bank, I would just submit to you, and I live in Cape Elizabeth, I know the town rather well, I would submit to you that the top of bank in this particular area or at the top of Fort Williams, for instance, is considerably different, for instance, than the top of bank at Crescent Beach. If we were to hold the actual uh, edge of the shoreline based on the effects of the tides at the top of bank in this particular case, and then go right around the corner to Crescent Beach, if we were to hold that elevation, the entirety of the end by the sea would be underwater. It doesn't work that way. You can have the end by this, or I mean, excuse me, you can have the top of bank, for instance, at a place like Fort Williams near the lighthouse, which is considerably higher than the beach, which is right down next to it in the same area of Fort Williams. And if you're looking at an established uniform elevation, in this case of 6.5, that's irrefutable. It's a set level. Otherwise, you're saying that you can be, un <coughs> excuse me, undulations in the ocean where you could have the top of bank here, and then around the corner, you've got the top of bank right here. Well, the ocean doesn't move that way. That's why we have one uniform level. Can I jump in with just one more question for you, Mr. Fisher? And it's kind sure. of a reiteration of a question I asked earlier, but just for clarity. Um, the definition in the Cape Zoning Ordinance of normal high water line of coastal waters being that line on the shore of tidal waters, which is the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tides, is consistent with the language that's in the, what I call the model DEP shoreland ordinance, which is also, um, I forget, but it's the standard language in yes. an ordinance. And when you look at exhibit D1 to the Murphy's Appeal on page three, the elevation method for defining the starting point of the shoreland zone is the use of the maximum spring tide level. Is that also the level that you were using as the HHT? Yes. I think we're talking two directions here, two dimensions. One is we're trying to determine how far the water comes in to measure horizontally back to the building. What our expert has just testified to is that the height changes, like the height of the top of the bank at one point is different from the height of the top of a bank at another point. The, the height isn't the ma what matters here, it's the distance away that matters because it says right in the beginning that the purpose is to protect from pollution and all that reaching the ocean. Just because it's 20 feet up here and 5 feet up here, when the pollution drops over that edge, it's still going to land in the ocean. 
its ledge. It all flows that direction. The purpose is to protect it. They've got a 250-foot zone of which the first 75 feet of that is st more stringently protected than the rest. They don't allow any building up there. It's, the whole zone is affected by the site coverage, how much impermeable surface is and so on. So the, it, irrespective of how high the tide is or whatever, that's simply to determine how far it encroaches on the land to begin that 75-foot measurement. But as I said before, in Cape, the, both the town manager and your planner have assured me that it is, in fact, measured from the top of the bank. Thank you, sir. So. Just in, in response to their expert. Last, last comment. Yeah, certainly. Just in response to their expert, um, again, we're, we're not contending that the top of the bank is, is the starting point for all of the shoreline within uh, Cape Elizabeth. Um, so I, I just wanted to correct that inaccuracy. Of course, it's not the top of the bank at Crescent Beach. And again, I think if you look at the language in the zoning ordinance, it's clear with regards to that. But it certainly is the top of the bank in this area. That's what's been applied to past permits in the past. In the MAC case, that's what was was decided, and it was, they were appealing a decision in which the top of the bank was used, and the court said that was correct. And then if you look at the Goldman property here, uh, with respects to a prior survey done from TICCOM, and I know there's going to be some objection to that, and that the uh, survey was inaccurate when it was done at that point in time, but in that survey done by TICCOM, which is a certified survey, that was used the top of the bank. Objecting to what? Objecting for the same grounds they objected before. It should be a rise and fall on its own, its, its merits. Not on the Goldman survey, not on what happened on the Goldman property, but on what's in front of you with respect to the Livingston property. Uh, and then if you look at another survey that was uh, conducted within the same area, again, top of the bank was used. And, 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 and that's what we're getting at today. The, the town of Cape Elizabeth, unless it wants to, shouldn't be picking and choosing. At one, in, in one instance, we're going to use the top of the bank. In another instance, we're going to use uh, what the DEP says. In another instance, we're going to use a different de definition for normal high tide line. And again, I will point to you that the 250-foot line and this area was started at the top of the bank. So to pick a different line, the 75-foot setback would be changing how the town of Cape Elizabeth's ordinance has been applying this for quite some time now. No, I, I don't want to drag this on anymore, but I do ask, want to ask you one question about the actual definition of the ordinance. Um, it's a common, at least from my perspective, it's a very common mistake that people use IE when they mean EG. Um, do you have any comments on whether the IE was indeed intended to be EG versus an IE? No, I, I'm not going to get into an argument with the venerable uh, Dean Godfrey. Uh, but no, I think it, it's exactly that. It's a pointing out to uh, examples where, where necessary. And, and I think people who went on the site visit could, this wasn't, a, this wasn't an instance of where you're trying to determine, uh, is this a beach or is this, is, is this the top of the bank or is this a cliff? And we're looking at uh, different, uh, different elements to, ter to determine where the extreme uh, limit of the tides is. Um, I, I think everybody could, the extreme limits of the tides here, there was a well-defined bank or cliff or, or whatever you want to call it. You could see that there um, where the, the vegetative line uh, stopped and the rocks began. Uh, and that's what's been used uh, for past uh, plans within, and we cited to many of these plans in the, in the, in the appeals, in the appeal that was filed. That's what was used in the past. Um, what has appeared to happen recently is a change with respect to that, a change of the, the application here in the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and whether that's right or not is, uh, is a decision that you folks are presented with today. Before you close the record on this, uh, on this matter, uh, Chairman, I just wanted to indicate that I was asked um, uh, by Michael McGovern, um, Bruce Smith had sent an email indicating um, 
the process by which he made his determination with regard to the setback issue that we've been discussing. Um, and I brought copies for the board to review. And I don't know whether the chairman wants to read it out loud or how the, he wants to do it, but I also have copies for the, the parties involved. So. I'd move to close uh, public comment on the issue of the definition of normal high water line of coastal waters. Second. All in favor? All right, guys, what do you think? Oh, yes, go ahead. I think it's important for us to maintain focus on what we're looking at, which is an appeal of the Clean Enforcement Officer's issuance of a permit based on a plan which shows the last page of the Murphy submission or the Murphy appeal documentation. It's a Livingston submission, I believe, which shows the wall and the patio at issue in this permit as outside the 75-foot setback from the shoreline zone. And I haven't seen evidence in the record to indicate that there wasn't <coughs> substantial evidence supporting the code enforcement officer's issuance of the permit based on this documentation and the subsequent survey. It, is that our standard? Are, are we review, are we, is this, a, and this might be a good question for the town council. Is this a de novo review? This is what they would call a quasi de novo review. Of course not. <laughs> because, because it's an appeal. So under normal circumstances, you wouldn't be taking evidence. But because there's this procedure in place where Persons who object to a permit, for example, have to be able to be permitted to show why it is they believe the permit was improperly issued. You have to take evidence that wasn't necessarily before the code enforcement officer. So it's why they call it quasi de novo review. The standard that you decided under is whether the decision appealed from, in this case, the issuance of the permit was clearly contrary to the ordinance and unsupported by substantial evidence in the record. So can you repeat that point again, so just so I have it all sure. fully absorbed? In addition to the actual standard, the, how, how are we evaluating the facts de novo that we're hearing? But then you, ask, you use the record that you've developed here. In that, but we determine based on the record we've developed here, based on the facts that we've heard, whether the actual decision itself was, had, had uh, go ahead and read it, it again it for perfectly me. For right. Us. Whether the decision was, was clearly contrary to the ordinance, so in other words, in essence, a legal determination on an interpretation of the ordinance. So are, are, does that mean that the interpretation of the ordinance from the code enforcement officer should be given deference? 
You have the ability to interpret the ordinance. De novo. Right. In order to resolve this issue. Right, exactly. The issue on appeal. Can you read the rest of that standard? And the rest of it is um, whether it's unsupported by substantial evidence in the record. So it is one of the findings of fact that we're going to be asked to determine whether the permit uh, as, or, or the application as submitted shows both the retaining wall and the patio being at least 75 feet from the high water line. I think, is that one of the things that we're going to need to determine here? I think, I think it is. Yeah, I, I think it is. I think all we need to say is that it's outside the shoreland. So. Right. Right. Could you read the motion again? I'm sorry? Could you read the motion again? Which motion is that? The, are we discussing a motion? Uh, I'm sorry. But just discussion. Just discussion. Yeah, we should probably get a motion going at some point here. But. Well, I think we're just discussing among ourselves at this point. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, if, if someone wants to someone wants to propound a motion, I'm certainly willing to, I think we're all willing to entertain it. That, <laughs> I, I've commented, yes. So uh, from my perspective, it all turns on the normal high water line of the coastal waters. And what is that definition? Uh, what is meant by tides? And what is meant by the extreme limit of the effects of the tides? And there is there is the wrinkle that they've used in IE, but I'm pretty sure an EG was meant. Um, it, nor, it, it, it's an EG. Um, I've... I'm familiar with this ordinance, and we make mistakes like this all the time through this ordinance. It is not an IE, even though the actual text is IE. Um, that's just my perspective, though. Uh, as to the interpretation from some of the other uh, members or uh, officials in the town, the, I, I understand that the town manager and the, the, the town planner have offered uh, or through uh, I'll use the phrase hearsay, we've heard have offered opinions as to what these mean. Um, what would carry weight for me would be a statement from the town council directly or a statement from the town CEO as to how that language was intended to be interpreted. Uh, the town manager and the town planner, their role in the overall operation of the town, uh, neither of them are necessarily to be given any weight in their opinions as to what this statute means. I'd, beyond, or what the ordinance means beyond what any individual from the room would, would offer an opinion on. Um, so I look at tides. What is tides? Is it storm tides? Is it someone you mentioned a tsunami? Is it a tsunami tide? Is it a normal tide? For me, I look at tides. It doesn't say storm. It doesn't say tsunami. I'm going to go with normal tides. So the next is extreme limit of the effect. So it is the top of the bank, given that from my perspective, it's an EG, not an IE. Um, is the top of the bank a effect of the tide? And it sounds like, from what, what I'm hearing, is that the bank itself is not formed by the, the tides. It is not the effect of the tides. So given that, looking at those two, I am leaning towards that the, the normal high water line of the coastal waters is not the bank, but I don't necessarily fully accept where it is from the bank down the rocks, but it seems to be that it is somewhere that is beyond the top of the bank. And, and that, that's, I mean, that's what I'm wrestling with is that I, I don't necessarily think it's the top of the bank, but I also don't necessarily think it's um, that, you know, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. so, so, so where does that leave us if, if we're on the same page is that it's not the top of the bank, but it's not the high water the mean high water mark. It's, it seems to me that we then look at what the code enforcement officer said he did in terms of determining which one of those different mechanisms to use and why he made that decision. Right. And then see whether that is legitimate under the ordinance or not. And so this would get to his email? Yeah. So he used 
just the, the surveyor, basically. Mm -hmm. And then the argument would basically be that there's a number of different approaches that can be used to reach the a determination as to what it is under this definition, one of which is looking at what, at, at number three. All right, and then I think we need to look at whether, based on that, whether that issuance of the permit was clearly contrary to the ordinance and whether it was unsupported by substantial evidence in the record. And I tell you that my, my thoughts are that it's not clearly contrary to the ordinance. Um, and the issuance of the permit was, in fact, supported by substantial evidence in the record today, including this email and the testimony from um, the engineer and his counsel. But that's my two cents on it. I, I mean, following up on that, and, and I, I mean, using the clearly contrary to the ordinance, that, that's what I'm latching on to right now, because I'm, I'm trying to latch on to something. And, and that's, I, I mean, clearly contrary. That seems like, I mean, it's, it's I understand there's a quasi de novo review, but mm -hmm. that, that's something. That's some sort of standard of review that we have. And, and clearly contrary seems to be a hurdle that you have to reach. Um, I think he had a basis for establishing you know, the 75-foot the setback based upon the, based upon the ordinance. Um, there's clearly a disagreement over where that water line is, but it's, I don't believe that, I mean, I, I think it was a, he used, it was a good faith um, effort on his part to, to establish it based upon a survey, based upon, we've seen two or three different surveys in the record here from um, various documents we've seen that have, you know, 109 feet, 75 feet, you know, graphical depictions of the stone wall being, or the retaining wall being um, outside of the 75 foot setback. I mean, th there's a lot of evidence there that would lead me to believe that, that he was mindful of, of making sure that he was in compliance of the ordinance. And again, he, he's faced with the same ordinance that we're struggling with as well. Right. I mean, so it's. It, I mean, the, all of these shoreland standards come from this, come from state statute, come from DEP um, model ordinances. And if you look at the DEP um, guidelines for how to figure out where the high tide line is. It's the visible inspection method, the elevation method, and then when there's, you know, looking at a clear upland edge. I mean, essentially what the code enforcement officer did was not only consistent with the plain text of the ordinance, but also with the background documentation regarding what is done at the state level. And I think you make a, a very good point and as, as I'm struggling with this, I guess, from my perspective, one aspect of um, attempting to define these lines is that at the end of the day, average ordinary citizen needs to be able to operate within what these decisions are and be able to have some level of certainty as to where the lines are. And it, from one perspective, um, a cliff clearly gives you a nice bright line, but it isn't where it is as a a, a matter of looking at the ground, it's as to what it is under the ordinance. And it seems that if we're looking at what this definition is and trying to reach a conclusion as to how, how to define this, and we have guidelines from the DEP that are not necessarily contrary to the language of our ordinance, which I imagine we'd have problems with our ordinance if it was contrary to what the DEP says. But it, the info sheet is how to establish the starting point for measurement of the shoreland zone. And this seems to be providing us with guidelines as to how to reach that conclusion. And yes, there is the italicized, and it is italicized, and it does use the word must. Uh, note also that where visual evidence, such as the presence of salt tolerant vegetation, very good point, it, it does discuss the saltwater vegetation, extends further inland than the measured tidal elevation. The line formed by the more restrictive criteria must be used. But I, from my perspective, that language is only applying where you can't already, it, it, it's not this situation because of the fact that 
there is not clearly salt tolerant vegetation that is salt to tolerant vegetation that has been created by virtue of tide coming in and soaking the water and inundating. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make much sense. Tide coming in, soaking the ground, inundating the plants, creating only salt to tolerant vegetation. And that, from my perspective, is what is intended by that language. So I agree that turning to this uh, DEP notice is very useful. And as an aside, I just wanted to thank both of the council for their presentations. They were very, very helpful. So I think, <clears throat> just talking about how we, how we proceed here, there are a number of findings of facts that were laid out prior to the last hearing. And those are sort of uh, logistical housekeeping ones. But I think the finding of fact that's going to be the ultimate one on at least this issue is, are the patio and the retaining wall more than 75 feet beyond the normal high water line of coastal waters? That, do you guys agree that that is the question? Yes. Um, I'm prepared to vote on that, um, if others are as well. Um, yes. So if we're ready, we can proceed to findings of fact. Okay. All right. We'll let we'll start with the we'll start with the prefatory ones and to begin with. One, Maynard and Deborah Murphy own and reside at 24 Pilot Point Road, directly across the street from the subject property, and as such, are abutters. All in favor? Two, on August 31st, 2012, a building permit application for 29 Pilot Point Road to replace an existing 50-foot by 20-foot concrete patio with a 20-foot by 20-foot stone patio and construct a retaining boulder wall was submitted by the owners of same. That permit was assigned building permit number 130072. All in favor of that finding of fact? On August 31st, 2012, building permit number 130072 was approved and issued as applied for. All in favor of that finding of fact? Four, on September 12th, 2012, an administrative appeal of my issuance, excuse me, on September 12th, 2012, an administrative appeal of the code enforcement officer's issuance of building permit number 130072 was submitted by Maynard and Deborah Murphy. All in favor of that finding of fact? Number five, uh, the patio and retaining wall are both more than 75 feet beyond the normal high water line of coastal waters. All in favor of that finding of fact? Unanimous. Um, based on those findings of fact, I propose some conclusions, namely, issuance of the permit was not clearly contrary, strike that, issuance of permit number 130072 was not clearly contrary to the Cape Elizabeth ordinances. I think we need to reach the lot coverage issue then before we can reach. Okay. Uh, have a finding. Hey, you want to, do you want to throw one out, a, a finding of fact on that or? Oh, uh, we, we haven't heard. Um, do well, we need to? We have uh, do, no, I don't think we have to. Outside the so Outside zone? the 70 foot. It's outside. Is that right? I, th I thought the lot coverage. That would make it not. Is it just 75? Is it it's not the 250? Is it the 75 or the 250? I thought it was the 250, yeah. Okay. All right, well then, uh, apparently we have ruled on the first issue. I don't totally understand this. So uh, there's a 75 foot mm -hmm. uh, buffer, zone, and, and then, then there's a 250 foot. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but I thought the uh, lock coverage applied to the 250, not, not yeah. just All the right. 75. Right? <laughs> well, yeah. but, Why don't we do this? We've, we've, we've made findings of fact on the issue of the, the, high, the high water line. High water line. Um, why don't we reopen this and hear from council on the issue of the, uh, the lot coverage and, and what, what standard we should be considering here. Do you happen to note that I have very little to say on this other than that uh, uh, Maynard has done the calculation on the lot coverage. He'll s submit that information for you. I don't know. That's, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we could ask the 
Mr. Gisette, Andre, before Mr. Murphy starts, do you want to point out to us what you think are the relevant parts of the code that relate to this issue? It's the chart. It's, it's, it's the chart. Again, I, I don't want to step on Mr. Murphy's toes here too much because he's done such good work and he was going to allude to this, but the section of code is uh, 19611. Again, as stated earlier, we requested permission to, to do, uh, have our own survey conduct, um, uh, conduct a survey that wasn't allowed. Uh, so uh, we used uh, the next best thing. Uh, Mr. Murphy, who, who is an engineer, uh, is much more equipped than I am uh, with respects to uh, again, looking at these kind of mathematical equations as to how you, uh, how you come to this measurement. So I'm going to have him speak to that. But again, the code is, uh, uh, section of the code is 19611. Uh, within the uh, 250 shoreland zone, uh, you can't have more than 20% uh, of the lock coverage. If you do, uh, it's considered a non-conforming structure. And then what? And then, again, as we, then the, the, the process uh, when you are doing any renovations within, with, uh, with respect to a non-conforming structure, which is what we've had here under this particular permit, uh, would have had, the process would have had to come before the Zoning Board of Appeals. So we'd be saying this is a non-conforming structure because we have more than the whole thing. More than 20 percent. More than 20 percent. So therefore, it would have had to come back to us again. Actually, Deb is the civil engineer. Uh, Deb did some calculations a couple of months ago utilizing a Google Earth image and conservatively in favor of the Livingston's estimated the lot coverage to be 31%. I have done the same calculations recently also utilizing Google Earth. <clears throat> also being conservative toward the Livingston's favor, I came up with approximately 33% before construction began. I'm going to explain how I calculated the lot coverage of the Livingston's property two times. Once of the lot before construction and site changes, and once recently accounting for the work done on the patio, driveway, and boulder wall permits. What type of engineer are you? Pardon? What type of engineer? I'm not an engineer. Deb is a civil engineer. Okay. It's okay. So first, what was the lot coverage before construction? To calculate lot coverage, I started with a Google Earth image, which is your third page. The scale is noted. It is three and a half inches per 200 feet. 200 feet divided by three and a half inches is 57.1 feet per inch. A sixteenth of an inch is 3.57 feet. The red lines on the Google Earth image show the approximate location of the property boundaries using information from the deed and from the inspection of premises. I cut with scissors around the red property lines and traced the property onto graph paper. You will note that the lot is not square. It is void of two triangular shaped wedges, one labeled A at the top with the other labeled B at the bottom. I calculated what the area of the lot would be if it included triangles A and B, and then calculated the area of triangles A and B and subtracted those from the lot to get a close approximation of the area of the lot. As the calculations show on page two, the large square area of 32,046 square feet minus the area of the triangles A and B together of 3,107 square feet equals an approximate lot area of 28,939 square feet. The actual lot size area on file with the town is 29,328 square feet, a difference of 389 square feet, which is 1.3% of the actual. 
in statistics and probability, any deviation within plus or minus 1.5 percent is statistically significant, meaning that Google Earth and our calculations of where the boundary lines are located is fairly accurate. From there, as you can see in note three, I calculated what 20 percent of the lot would be in square footage, and that's 5,866 square feet and calculated how much of the lot that would fill up from the bottom up, if you will. Since the lot is 147 feet wide, I divided the 5,866 5, square feet by 147 feet to get approximately 50, uh, 40 feet of length. I then had to convert that 40 foot measure to an inch measure that I could put on paper. Using the scale of 57.1 feet per inch, I divided the 40 feet by 57.1 and got 0 0.7 inches, or 11 sixteenths of an inch. So I measured up 11 sixteenths of an inch from the bottom to get to the 20% area. I then proceeded to cut out the impervious surfaces and tape them to the square. Please note that the main part of the driveway, the garage, the house, and the patio take up all of the 20% area. The remaining part of the main driveway along with the east and west drives, and the remaining part of the west wing and the stairs on the east end of the house are stacked on top of the 20% area. Some of the west wing is out beyond the 20% area in the lower right. If you were to take that and use it to fill in around some gaps around the east and west drives above, you can easily estimate north of 30% lot coverage. I estimate it to be at 33%. Nonconformance requires review and approval by the ZBA. Did you say you estimated that? Yeah. yeah okay. So, I'm probably misunderstanding these plans. But what I'm seeing on these two different plans is the first one saying lot coverage prior to construction and site changes, and then all of the stuff moved right. down into the bottom, and it looks like we're at, say, 35 to 38 percent. And then after, we're below 30 percent. Right. I haven't gotten to that yet. Okay. In, in out of curiosity, the driveway itself, do you know is material? Is it asphalt? Is it uh, pavers? Um, pavers. And are they the I pavers believe. that are like the ring ones that have the grass that can grow through them, or are they solid? Are I they think so. Would solid. that be correct? They're, they're solid, and um, an impervious surface can be as simple as if you were driving on a grass lawn and impacting that with a vehicle, that would be an impervious surface. I don't know that that would be within the definition of impervious surface in the ordinance on page 10. But can I ask a question just to kind of get to the point? Um, are, are these plans saying that the lot coverage after the construction is less than before the construction? Yes. Okay. Because the east side uh, drive was removed, uh, the west side drive was removed, and some patio was removed and replaced with a smaller amount. So for the lot coverage after the driveway and patio removals, I did the calculations the same way. And after removal of the west side of the driveway and some of the patio, and after adding impervious surface to make a driveway turnaround area on the east end of the driveway, and also adding boulder retaining wall with stairs, the net lot coverage is still between 20 and 30%, which looks to be around 24% on there. I'm done, yes. Thank you.
I'm not a math person either, so, but what I'm struggling with is figuring out why this matters. And I don't think that they've managed to jet provide any argument as to why it matters, because I don't think they can. They've come up here and they've said, oh, well, if it's non-conforming because it has more than 20%, then that has to go before the DBA before we can get a permit. They don't cite anything for that. They don't cite to your ordinance. They don't explain how that applies in your ordinance, what part of the ordinance makes that a mandatory requirement. They don't say any of that. And I think that the reason why they don't is because they can't. Because if you look at 19-4-4, which is nonconformance within the Shoreline Performance Overlay District, and then we assume that this is nonconforming. Let's assume that they're right. It's a nonconforming structure. Well, OK. Nonconforming buildings or structures. There's one on enlargement. There's a section on relocation, reconstruction, and replacement, a change of use of a nonconforming structure, nonconforming accessory structures, and then we get to nonconforming uses. It's not a change of use of a nonconforming structure, so that doesn't apply. It's not a nonconforming accessory structure, that does not apply. It is not a reconstruction or a replacement, so that does not apply. It's not a relocation. We are not relocating the building. The closest one, the only one that's even remotely applicable is enlargement, except we're not enlarging it. But the only one that, that's actually even remotely close is enlargement, because that seems to be the same type of thing that we're doing, and that's a code enforcement officer decision, not a ZBA decision. So All it seems like the argument would be that it's a reconstruction or a replacement. The, the patio itself, is it the original concrete and uh, a, a portion of it has been jackhammered off and removed, or has a new patio been put in it? Okay, let's assume that that's what they're arguing, because then look at that section. If you look at that section, you've got one paragraph which talks about it being uh, destroyed by more than 50% of the market value. Well, that doesn't apply because there's no way anyone can argue that the removal of this patio impacted the structure by 50% or more. Okay, that's the whole first paragraph that we do not need to talk about anymore. And then we get to the second paragraph. And this only talks about located less than the... the so, be, before we go on, structure, though, could also be defined as the patio itself. Well, the patio is contiguous with the building. I would say that you'd have a hard time, particularly in a town of Union versus Strong, which found that a deck was a part of a, a building. I'd say that you'd have a hard time concluding that the patio is itself a separate structure from the building. Then you get to the second paragraph, which is non-conforming structure located less than a required setback from water body. Well, already we don't apply because you found that it's not. But even if we did, it's destroyed by 50% or less of the value, market value, excluding normal maintenance or repair. Maybe you're constructed in place if a building permit is obtained by the code enforcement officer within one year. So even to the extent that this is a reconstruction or relocation, then that provision says you go to the code enforcement officer, because this is clearly less than 50% or less of the market value of that building. Now it goes to the code enforcement officer. The reality is, is that under the enlargement section, we are entitled to enlarge our building by a certain percentage with a permit from the code enforcement officer. What has happened here is that the Livingstons have made their property more conforming. That's what they just testified to. That's the only fact that they testified to that should have any significance at all here. They said before it was X percentage, after it was Y percentage, and Y percentage is less than X. There is less lot coverage today than there was after the permit. I don't think the ordinance says anything because the ordinance plainly contemplates that you should be allowed to make your property less nonconforming if you ask for it. I think the only thing that's even remotely by analogy related to this would be the enlargement section. I don't, I'm not sure that even applies. I think it's just a building permit to, to do work on your property that in this case ends up reducing the size and reducing the lot coverage of your property. The only way, and I think the, 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 the reverse of that too is, if they're gonna get before this, if they're gonna say that it gets before you, that it should have gone before you, they need to have an argument that from the ordinance, not just, well, we think that this is what happens, but from the ordinance it says, this is how it has to go based on our facts. I, it, there's nothing. There's not been anything that says that if it's 20%, what we are doing 
would fall under one of the categories that requires a ZBA approval. They've never said that there's anything like this. All that's been happening is, is that they've reduced the nonconformity. And I think ultimately, if you look at it, the only th conclusion that you can reach here is that the Livingstons are entitled to do what they got the permit to do, and the code enforcement officer was correct to issue it. And it, ultimately, it doesn't matter whether it's 25 or 30 or 50 or 100 percent block coverage. Because the other thing to remember as well, and this hasn't been made yet, but I think it's an important one, this lot coverage predated the work that the Livingstons did. I believe that it predates the enactment of the ordinance. So this is a grandfathered nonconformity. I mean, it is, a, it is a legal nonconformity. They did not create a nonconformity. They did not add to the, the amount of lot coverage. This is what was there, and they've reduced it. If they want to say that it has to come to the ZBA, they need to make an argument pointing to a specific section in the ordinance that gives the ZBA authority over it, and then we can, we can counter it. But right now, I, I mean, I, I apologize. I kind of feel like I'm spinning my wheels, but I don't even know what, why they think it goes to the ZBA, and I don't think they've, there's anything in the ordinance that says it has to. Um, just real quick. Uh, there are parts of the, the ordinance I think you can all read which when you do have a non-conforming structure uh, and activities uh, that require site, you know, activity that's being performed, uh, whether it's reconstruction, expansion, removal, anything along those lines uh, requires site plan review by the EBA <coughs> under section uh, 1992. Say, say that again, what section? Section 1992. This is an activity requiring something. Uh, and again, that's been that's been issue that already indicated in the in the Murphy's uh, appeal. Um, and, and and without you know belaboring the points, you, you know, again, if it, if this was going uh, in front of the zoning board. Again, certain things would come up, such as you're, you're moving structures closer uh, to the shoreland zone. Um, for example, the retaining wall, which was never there before, and things of that nature. Um, and, 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 and again, we keep, with, again, belaboring the point, but this, you know, the, the correct process would have been followed, and that's what's been frustrating about not just this permit, but all the permits that's been going on here is that, that, that those procedures weren't followed and, and weren't implemented correctly and were based off false information. What section of the ordinance requires the ZBA to conduct site plan review? I may have cited to the wrong one, but it was well, you any, 1992. 1992. 1992. And what subsection oh. is invoked with, in, in this scenario? I mean, where I mean, there's a list of five, right. five instances where site plan review must be undertaken. And which of those five are we here? We can't even do site plan review. In 1992B, activities not requiring site plan review. First subsection, and that would seem to fall squarely in what we have here. Construction, alteration, or enlargement of a single family or two family dwelling unit, including accessory buildings and structures. Any non-residential, if you look at uh, section 1992A2, any non-residential expansion or change in use. Uh, non it's non-residential. Sorry, I can't point to it right now, but again, it's. Um, 19.4.4, sorry. Sing, uh, no. Hold on. So under B, which sections are you saying we should look to? And 
this is so this is a non conforming property. The argument would be that it's non conforming by virtue of the lot coverage. Being right. more than 20%. Greater than 20%. Even though they reduced it. Just to go back on one point that Mr. Schumann had talked about, about the grandfathering, and I was just looking at the um, guidelines, just, just to go back on that, just to make sure it's covered. Chapter 1000, Section 15B, um, on page 17, um, states in, in the Mandatory Shoreline, the Shoreland Zoning Act, talking about non-conforming structures. The total footprint area of all structures. So you're looking at the state model right now, right? Not mm -hmm. our Which is a minimum standard, right? Right? Is that? Not once you have a local ordinance. Well, the local ordinance has to at least be yes, as... Yes, but once we have an enacted ordinance, we look to our ordinance. Okay, but the total footprint area of all structures, parking lots, and other non-vegetated surfaces within the shoreland zone shall not exceed 20% of the lot a portion thereof located within the shoreland zone, including land area previously developed, except in the general development district, which was a different district. And that's got a different, that's a 70%. Okay, so is there a section in 1944 that you all are pointing to? Yeah, I guess I'm back to that. Aren't yeah, as, assuming that the calculations are correct and it, the, the lot coverage is non-conforming and exceeds the 20 percent, as pointed out by the Livingston's Council, the issue then becomes what aspect of the code um, requires either review by us or review by the code enforcement officer that would prohibit them from reducing the level of lot coverage or from uh, altering the, the patio itself in order to shrink its size. Specifically, it, oh, go ahead. Specifically uh, looking at 1944 sub B on page 41 through 42 and 43. Because otherwise the Livingston's position is that there, there is no uh, section of the ordinance that triggers a review by us or the code enforcement officer. Again, in Looking at this in a vacuum with respect to just the lot coverage, then I, I think that's where somebody may make that, that, that argument would be put forth. But again, in light of their appeals and in light of, again, what, what the Murphy's objection has been all along with respect to all of these appeals is taking everything together. These things weren't, weren't initially stated as they were supposed to. Lot is coverage there a specific was, provision? What's that? Is there a specific provision? There's not. At least one that I found. To move to close uh, public comment. Second. All, in, second. All in favor? Should we pick up with our findings or do we need more discussion? Or? Picking up with the findings sounds good. Okay. I'm, I'm let, let me throw one out there and when people think that it should be rephrased, tell me that before we vote. In case we're a little bit on the fly here. Um, <coughs> to the extent that the Livingston structure is non-conforming, the construction of the new patio uh, made that structure more conforming with provisions of the ordinance. Not terribly artfully put, I, but. I mean, do we need to state that it made it more conforming? I think it's, I think it's relevant. The yeah. lot coverage issue wouldn't even be a building nonconformance. It would be a lot nonconformance, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's part of the structure. I, I would alter the language slightly sure. to um, just incorporate the fact that there was a reduction. In right, the go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, <laughs> Not so easy, is it? No, it isn't. <laughs> Uh, 
the uh, finding of fact would be that, um, let's see here, the, the code, the, the uh, finding of fact would be the overall lot coverage was decreased uh, by, the, by the permit sanctioned. The, the, the overall lot coverage uh, was rendered less non-conforming by the reduction in size of the pre-existing patio. All in favor? Um, I'd also have a, a, a finding of fact that, that we put in there that the, the appellants appointed to no provision of the ordinance uh, prohibiting the issuance of the permit in this sort of case where it makes to the extent that the lot or the structure is non-conforming, makes it less non-conforming. All in favor? I'm sorry, can you repeat yeah, that? Yeah, I'm not sure I can, <laughs> but I, I can try. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 the appellants have pointed to no provision of the code um, that prohibits act the actions by the Livingstons to the extent that the permit sanction construction made the non-conformance of the lot less non-conforming. Reduce the non-conformity? Period. Sure. You want to? I just don't want to get into what. No, I, I know. I, I've, I've got triple negatives going on in there. So, um, why don't we just say it? I, maybe we can just say it this way. Um, appellants have introduced no evidence. Um, I don't know. Help. Use, use some assistance here, guys, on this one. I think you know what I'm trying to get at, but the hour is getting late, so. Pro prohibiting the improvement upon the Livingston's land, which decreased. It's nonconformity. The the appellants have not identified a section of the ordinance uh, prohibiting the Livingston's from reducing the nonconformity of the lot coverage th through the reduction in size of the existing patio. All in favor? <laughs> Did you get that? Because I want to. It's, it's videotaped. Um, yeah, I want to yeah. delete the lot, the lot conformity. Yeah. Should, we, should somebody write this down? Yeah, yeah. probably. Sorry. Let's start. Okay. That sentence you want again, to, and I'll write it down. And we'll the record it. contains no Reference. evidence indicating code enforcement error in issuing the permit allowing the Livingstons to complete work reducing nonconformity on their property, nonconformity of their property. Can someone read that back? The record contains no evidence indi indicating code enforcement error in issuing the permit to allow the Livingstons to complete work reducing the nonconformity of the property. Um, the only thing I would say, and I'm just getting back now to the, the standard of review, should we incorporate the clearly contrary. And I was going to make conclusions of, of law okay. After, okay. after that. Yeah, I think I, yes. So the answer is yes. Okay. So, so there, you want to read it once more and then we'll vote on it? The record contains no evidence indicating code enforcement error in issuing the permit to allow the living sins to complete work reducing the nonconformity of the property. All in favor? Um, <coughs> the proposed two conclusions. Um, issuance of permit number 130072 was not clear, clearly contrary to the provisions of the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance. All in favor? Issuance of permit number 130072 was supported by substantial evidence in the record. All in favor? And um, I, I move that the decision here be that the uh, administrative appeal of Maynard and Deborah Murphy 
of the Code Enforcement Officer's issuance of Building Permit Number 130072 be denied. Uh, all in, Second. All in favor? Take a three minute break before we go to the next one. That's okay. Some people have to use the bathroom. Oh, oh, so, okay. Um, I must be looking okay. at it.
All right. We're going to go back on the record. <laughs> the next matter is uh, the administrative appeal of Maynard and Deborah Murphy of the CEO's issuance of building permit number 130056 for an additional accessory structure at 27 Pilot Point Road tax map U12, lot 70, as this structure will add over 250 square feet of impervious surface to this lot within the 250-foot shoreland zone. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Murphy, or council. With respect to the uh, the Goldman appeal, again, I don't, I don't think I have to restate many of the same many of the same arguments here apply. Um, I, I will uh, point to. Um, uh, I, I think it's already been clear with respect to the issue of standing that the the right of way is there. Uh, some differences with respect to this appeal versus the other appeal, though, is that this particular uh, this particular um, Requests uh, seeks to uh, this is an expansion. Uh, this is a, a change of use. Uh, this is an, a um, uh, replacement uh, structure. Um, again, if you look at and uh, in, in our first arguments with respect to that is with respect to this 75 foot setback. Again, there was a tick come survey that was done for some plans in the past that set that at the top of the bank. Uh, recognizing the uh, board's decision today, um, we would maintain that that's still the correct uh, measurement uh, from where that should be uh, uh, taken, uh, taken from. In addition, uh, with respect to that plan, that plan also uh, discusses um, the, uh, the percentage of the use uh, in, the, in that plan. Uh, And it only left, uh, I think the, the calculation was uh, 2.52, 2 thank you, um, square feet. And so any addition to that uh, would certainly uh, go beyond the lock coverage. That would be an expansion of the lock coverage. Um, and, and, and I think the rebuttal argument now is that uh, we're going to be moving the, uh, in order to make this. Uh, conforming and for the uh, lock coverage not to come into play, uh, we're saying that, well, the 250-foot uh, shoreland zone is being taken, was uh, inaccurate. We need to take it from a different uh, point. Uh, I would submit to you, uh, again, that the 250-foot uh, 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 line where that, that point is uh, start from in your own zoning ordinance, in your own zoning court, uh, zoning code uh, starts at the top of the bank, uh, and that has been established. And actually, if you look at uh, if you look at uh, the Goldman's lot, uh, and again the the material that was submitted earlier, which showed uh, which kind of showed a close up of that of that area. If you look at the the Goldman's lot, that is all within the the 250 foot uh, shoreland zone. They're now saying, don't use that. Use something different. Change that. And I would submit to you, I don't think you, I don't think you can under your own zoning ordinance. Um, so again, those would be the two reasons why we're saying that, again, this permit was issued in violation, uh, both with respects to the 75-foot setback, as well as the uh, uh, increase in the uh, um, uh, increase in the the, the lock coverage. Uh, uh, percentage of coverage for lot coverage. Uh, can, can you just repeat what your argument is with respect to the 75 foot setback in, in this instance? It, it, again, it, it's the same arguments that the 75 foot setback is, is based on the, the top of the bank 
this is this is consistent uh, with two things consistent with the uh, um, with the plan uh, submitted uh, in an in earlier uh, in an earlier p uh, permitting uh, process in which the Goldmans were were making uh, some additions uh, to their property. So and that was set at the top of the bank by their certified survey. But the, the map that I think this was submitted by the Murphys, this big map, this this is the new map. I, I'm just looking at I'm looking at this. It was drafted by the Goldmans, but submitted by the Murphys. Okay, and I, I think right. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And so the Murphys disagree with this. I think I'm just looking at the seven. Isn't this the 75 foot? 75 foot is set from the top of the bank. I, we do not disagree with that. So the, I think the, the position is that if and if you look at the new permit, they 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 relied on a new uh, measurement for the for the 75 foot. This paper document, if we went by this paper document, the argument is that this paper document from the Goldmans sets the the uh, the line at the cliff, which. Right. As if it were set at the cliff, all of their lot would be within the 250 feet. But as we just covered on the prior uh, issue on appeal, we said that the line is not at the cliff. It's somewhere farther out, but we didn't define where the line is. And so, why does that matter? Because the, I think the argument is that if the line is further out, the very end of the back of the lot will no longer be in the 250 foot uh, setback requirement and therefore the coverage back there would not be co go into the lot calculation. Not, not the argument that the Murphys are raising, but I believe likely that's the argument we're going to hear from the Goldmans. And that's what the I believe you're correct. So, so the, the issue, again, this isn't an issue of anything being built in the 75 foot setback. Y y yes, we're arguing that in this case it is now because if you look at what's looking to be constructed, uh, would be within the 75 foot setback. And is, is what's being and is what's planned to be constructed indicated on this map? So I think the packet we received, mm. at least the packet I received, didn't have what is planned to be constructed. You don't have the okay. their permit in front of you? No. no. I have a permit file right here. Make sure these all get back into the. So, what is this survey? The big one. That the, the big one was based on a prior uh, permitting uh, that they had done with respect to uh, expansions and additions that they'd done in their house. So, so this isn't this is not reflective of what's being done. Correct. And what's looking to be done now is is uh, additions within uh, in front of their in front of their house with respect to uh, stairs, uh, walls, um, and 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 what we what we're maintaining is that is being conducted within the 70 foot shoreland setback. Um, and this is what was submitted to the code enforcement officer, and this is what he was looking yes, at. Yes, that was submitted, and now that, and, and, and again, consistent with most of these, uh, all of these new permits, uh, which we've taken issue with, there seems to be a new standard that's being applied within the 70 foot, so with respect to where you start the 75 foot setback from, um, that, that Mr. Smith has, has recently been uh, applying. So are you saying that they're a stop from taking advantage of what we may or may not rule about where that 75 foot setback starts because they had a plan and I would I would maintain I would maintain two things uh, one is uh, with respect to the 75 foot setback uh, this case is on its own merits apparently I recognize I may be wasting my time but we would we would submit to you that this was this is what uh, the the in, uh, back in 2005, I believe, this is what Bruce Smith applied. He's now applying something different. Um, and, and, and again, that's what's been part of the problem all along. 
And number two, again, we have an expansion of, of, of lock leverage. Um, and, and you can't, uh, even, if, even if you want to move that 75-foot uh, setback line, uh, I would submit to you that you, at the very least, you can't move the 250-foot uh, line because that's already been set by your ordinance. Without the improvements shown on this plan, on this survey, how can I tell whether the two are different? Well, you can tell the two are different because on the new plan, they're measuring the 75-foot setback, uh, not from the top of the bank. Let me I just can see a line that on here on the TITCOM survey is labeled as top of the bank, but there is no way for me to tell whether in actuality that is or is not the same high water mark that was. Well, that, if that top of the bank is located in Surfside Avenue. The right of way. And again, what we would submit to you that issue is is a, is a uh, permit that was uh, applied wrongly, apl applied on wrong uh, information. Uh, and, and should not have been granted. Because it's within the 75 foot setback and because. There's an expansion of the lot. An expansion of the lot, of, of the <coughs> area. So your position covers. is that it's the code enforcement officer's job to go and comp compare historic plans and determine what plans to utilize in issuing or not issuing a permit that he cannot rely on professional plans that were issued and submitted as part of an application? Well, that's, that's the issue here is that, one, we, we're, and what we've indicated in the past is, is the plans that are submitted in a lot of these cases aren't even certified plans or they're sketch drawings. Uh, in this is case- required you, in the ordinance? Uh, are certified plans required in the ordinance? I can read to you what's required in the, uh, and this is, uh, it, this, is, uh, this is with respect to the, the permitting process. It cites the section 1933 building permits and says, uh, if there's any doubt as to the location of a property line uh, uh, or if the code enforcement officer cannot confirm that all setback requirements are met, the code enforcement officer may require the applicant to provide a boundary survey or mortgage inspection plan. It's may, not must, right? Correct. And that's if there's doubt. Correct. And I would submit to you that I think what we've learned all here today that there's a lot of doubt with respect to that. And there has been inconsistencies with respect to his application of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of how he's applying the uh, shoreland setback in these instances. Was there doubt with the code enforcement officer in this situation? What's that? Was there doubt with the code enforcement officer in this situation? Uh, uh, I, I can't speak for what, what was going on in, in Bruce Smith's head at the time when he made this determination, but um, in, in 2005, the, their building plans were set at the top of the bank, um, and now he's, he's, he's using another, another measurement in this particular area. And I'm, I'm going to guess you don't have this calculation readily available, but if, as we had previously discussed um, in the prior appeal, the uh, high water line is somewhere other than at the, the cliff edge, such that the, do you have any idea how much of the back of the lot, I guess since we haven't defined where the actual uh, yeah, that is, it makes it a little hard to determine that, um, how much of the lot is not, sit, Let's just throw a number out there. Let's say 20 feet of the back of the lot is not within the 250 foot. That, that's where I Does think that, that the yeah, I think that's where the issue is a little bit clearer because uh, your your own zoning ordinance has established uh, where the 250 foot uh, line starts from, and and, and I don't, I'd submit to you that the zoning board of appeals doesn't have the ability to change that here and today, and that this particular <coughs> lot uh, sits within within that shoreline. 
Does the proposed work change the impervious surface? Uh, yes. Uh, this How is much? all. Uh, we did not. We did not do the calculation on it because it. it what, uh, well, Can you come on up? or minus feet, and then I don't have the, um, the amended plan, but I think it says 292, so I was conservative on that. Um, and at issue is you have a zoning map that's part of the ordinance, and to amend that, I don't, as Andre said, I don't think that's something that you can do right now. The 200 lot coverage is solely in the 250 foot zone. That lot is entirely in the 250-foot zone per the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance. So you can't move that back line and say that now all of a sudden the garage and the driveway are not in the zone because the zone has been established. So as we were talking about in the last appeal, what's assuming that everything that you're saying is 100% accurate, assuming that this lot is entirely within the shoreland zone, assuming that lot coverage was increased by 292 feet, what provision of the ordinance prohibits the code enforcement officer from issuing this permit? Because you're, in this case, there's no reduction of impervious surface, you're increasing it, and you have more than 20 Can you point me to a provision of the ordinance to look to? Yes. In the definitions, 19-1-3, just starting there, you've got your zoning map. I just have to go through this the way that I went through it. So if it, and that's on page 22. Then on 19-2-2, two two, it talks what about. What on 22 am I looking at? What on page um, Just the definition of the zoning map. I just need to follow through with my thought process. So on the definition of the zoning map. It, I'd note that our page numbers all differ because oh. of how things are printed. Well, it's in 19-1-3. It's the very last definition. Um, in section 19-2-2, it talks about the zoning map. Can you tell me the page number for that? Well, I have um, in the most recent, I just uh, copy page 23. We're on the same page. Okay. Um, it's certified, and it's, the zoning map is hereby made a part of the ordinance. Um, then in 19-2-5, it talks about location of resource protection district boundaries. If somebody disputes where those boundaries are in section 19-2-5B, it talks about what they have to do to try to say you need to reset that boundary. We can't do that. You cannot do that. Correct. What's next? So there's, there's an expansion, and, and as noted on the plan, the 2.52 square feet that was left with just the structure that they had originally done didn't include eaves. It didn't include the drip basins all around the house, and it didn't include the patios that they've already added. So they're way over 20%. So now you're going to add more to it, so you're expanding a non-conforming structure. Okay, and why can't the code enforcement or officer do that? Tell me why. Give me a section of the ordinance that says that he can't do because that. Because you're expanding. Can you point me to a section of the ordinance? Oh, God. I do. I'm trying. It's in here. Is it 19? Understanding that the, the limit on impervious surface is 20%. Correct. Assuming that's accurate, assuming they're over that, assuming that they increase the nonconformity of the structure, 
What provision of the ordinance prevents the code enforcement officer from authorizing that? You can't, you can't, you can't make the non-conformance more non-conforming. I understand that entirely, so, but you, I need a provision of the ordinance that not, tells me. Look at 1944C1. Okay. Page. In mine, 42-ish. 44 on mine. <laughs> yeah. It's expansion of non-conformance. So before we were in 1944B, which is on page 41 through 43 of our ordinance. This is where we were in the last appeal. Is there a provision in there that prohibits the code enforcement officer from issuing a permit like the one we're talking about? Under enlargement, a non-conforming use of a building or, oh, that's use of a building or structure. Well, it is a structure, that's right. And that provision says a non-conforming structure may be added to or expanded after obtaining a permit from the code enforcement officer, which is what happened in this circumstance. Provide that such addition or expansion does not increase the non-conformity of the structure. Of the structure. Oh, wait a minute. Right. Okay. And then also it's, a, it's an accessory structure. So it seems like... Okay. In 194-4B... A non-conforming structure may be added to or expanded after obtaining a permit from the code enforcement officer provided that such addition or expansion does not increase the non-conformity of the structure. And what is the non-conformity of this structure? The lot coverage. You're the adding more is impervious. It's not a non-conformity of a structure. It's a non-conformity of a lot. No, you're wrong. The definition tell, by the state. Tell me. <laughs> tell me. Okay, I will. The definition this is of our what? DEP issue profile, no, non-conforming. No, I need it in the ordinance. I think I, I direct you to uh, B5, non-conforming accessory structure on a non-conforming lot of record. Does that provide what you're looking for? Well, I think we, it, it's a non, is it agreed that it's a non-conforming lot? Or, or is it? It's a non-conforming structure. But is it your position? Structure. Is it your opinion it's a non-conforming lot? What is a non-conforming structure? A non-conforming structure is one that does not meet one or more of the following dimensional requirements. Shoreline, setback, height, and lot or lot coverage. It only has to meet one, not meet one of those. What are That's you reading, a minimal. What are you reading to me from? I'm reading you from the DEP issue profile on the DEP website, non-conforming structures those, in the Shoreland Zone. Those definitions do not apply under our ordinance. We, we need to look at the definitions of non-conformity in our ordinance. So those are the only definitions we can apply. Joanna, just for clarification, so what you're saying is that because you're saying that the lot is something different than a structure, so we have to show that uh, something is, is uh, more than 20% with, with respect to the lot, and so you're applying a different, different de definition to lot versus structure? The two are defined separately. For example, if you look in our ordinance on page 15, there's a definition of non-conforming building, which is similar to a non-conforming structure, and there's a definition of non-conforming yeah. lot. And I guess I'm looking to you to make your argument as to what, why Can you, you should overturn the code enforcement officers. Would you officers please permit. cite that again? Page 15 through 16. It's in section 1. Thank you. Definition. Three definitions. One point. Which definitions? Non-conforming building. Nineteen dash one dash three. On a mine, which is a new one like yours, it's on page fifteen through sixteen. Again, I I would submit to you that well, and, and I think and I'm trying to point out the, at least with respects to our appeal, those, mat those matters that, were, that we deemed to be uh, a bit big, but for example, in their appeal, they also discuss some of the other setback violations, and so that would apply here, but also, and, and, and again, I, I think That's I right. know where you 
keep moving straight. Uh, I would submit to you that, or other similar lot requirements of the district in which it is located. Um, and, and here's where, I guess, in this case, you're saying uh, sure structure is different than lot, but I would, I would, I would hold a different. Uh, so it seems like your, argument the that. argument that you would be putting forth is that because, it's a, because it's when you're measuring the lot, when you're looking at that 20% lot coverage, you're, you're factoring out all, all the impervious uh, structures on that lot. On the lot, yes. So, so it's a non-conforming lot under this de definition by virtue of the lot coverage at a minimum, if not other criteria, is your argument. Correct. And then because it's a non-conforming lot coverage, I direct your attention to 1944B. Five, which for me is page 42. Right it could be 42 for some other people. 42 is yes. Oh, that's true. 43. They are, um, so then this, th what this is, is a non-conforming accessory, accessory structure, one would potentially be arguing, and that on a non-conforming lot of record, which addresses the concern about what, what is on appeal. So this and is how I... Right, and it's also a non-conforming lot of record because um, it has... The, it's below the minimum shore frontage of 150 feet. So, so setting that it's one aside, feet. but in, in, instead viewing this under the position you had noted that this, the official zoning map is the official zoning map. What it sets is inside of the zone is inside of the zone. Ex accepting that argument for purposes of the discussion right now, it would trigger five, which is non-conforming accessory structure because this is a non-conforming lot of record because of the lot coverage which then says that if what's on there is a residential structure and it's not possible to place an accessory structure meeting the required water body tributary, yeah. so on and so forth, we would then would look to see if these criteria are met in order to determine right. whether it's properly granted. Yes. But even then, under that section, it's just code tools. enforcement officer. Well, it's, it's just for the storage of yard tools. But then we have... Yeah, but you'd have to meet all those criteria. Well, the code enforcement You'd have to have no option. That there, there's no requirement that under that provision that it come to us. It says it's not possible to place it, structure. You'd have to meet some exceptions. Uh, And the reason why we have then jurisdiction to hear the appeal would then be because of the fact that That's we can awful. hear it. We can determine whether any decision by the CEO is in conformity with the provisions of the ordinance. And so the question would be, is it permitted to grant a permit to place a, a single access, a structure under this provision? Well, unless they point to another provision. I guess I would look to them to pick what provision yeah. they're appealing okay. under. Well, okay. And I guess the question that I'm left with is what provision pro permits the introduction of an additional accessory structure if we've already exceeded the lot coverage? I mean, this only this permits it in a very, very narrow circumstance. Right. Obviously not. Here. Your backyard shit. Right. Basically. Keep your, your lawn going. That, that's obviously not this. There are clearly provisions in here allowing for adding to or expanding non conforming structures with just a code enforcement officer permit. I mean, they have not argued that that's. Adding a non conforming structure? Expansion. Adding to or enlarging. Enlargement under yeah, B1. Of a pre existing. Mm -hmm. And then you have the 30% that you're permitted. But in this situation, it's the addition of a new, not previously standalone. existing, standalone structure that was not there before. That is closer to the water than any pre-existing structure. I mean, is it ours to make the arguments about what this is? <laughs> Why don't we hear from Mr. Kresge? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So can I just ask where, so if maximum lot coverage is 20% and you can't exceed it, you can Why? exceed it in certain circumstances under Section 9.4-4 of the ordinance, where non-conformance non within the shoreland performance overlay district is allowed in certain circumstances with just a code enforcement officer permit. 
and that's why we're asking what provisions of those are you saying were violated? I think that you'd have to meet the stand. There are very strict um, exceptions when somebody is trying to do something um, beyond what the ordinance allows. And in 196-11, in the de definition of lot coverage, it's very specific that you can't expand that. So is this a situation where this has to be added to this lot? Is it something that drives, that, that has to happen? And I would say that the criteria that you can, because if you were going to, this would have to go, I feel this would have to go for a variance. And I don't know that if it did, that you could say, okay, because Section it exceeds 20 percent. Four dash four, which runs from pages 40 through 43 of the ordinance, delineates the circumstances in which non-conforming lots, structures, et cetera, can be um, enlarged, replaced, reconstructed, et cetera. It doesn't appear to have something for a new structure, though, which this is yeah. not a replacement or an, or an extension or an expansion. <coughs> Other than the non-conforming accessory structure that obviously doesn't. So, yeah. And, um, Yes, I think I'm pretty comfortable with that not applying here. Um, unless Mr. Golden is going to tell us he's going to store his rakes and stuff on it. I don't think that's probably the plan. Um, Why don't we hear from Attorney yeah. Tresky? Mr. Mr. Tresky, please. Good evening. Um, my name is John Mitchell, Mitchell & Associates. We're landscape architects uh, located in Portland. We represent Mr. and Mrs. Goldman. Um, I'd like to first just take the board through the process that we went through to arrive at the documentation uh, for our application. Um, before we did any sort of uh, design work, we met with Bruce on two occasions met October 14th in his office to review the project and the zoning ordinance and all the, the standards and requirements and so forth. Um, and at that time, he said, what you're proposing is permitted. Um, there's a section in the ordinance under shoreland zoning that you are per permitted to put uh, a set of stairs to provide access. Uh, within the shoreland zone, as well as within the 75-foot setback. Do you know where that is? Yeah, that was great. I saw that. I don't remember. That is uh, on in my ordinance. It's on page 140, paragraph F. Um, One minute. Sorry, I'm going to. Oh, that's okay. Section, if I can. Is that it's 19.6. 11. 19-6-11. Capital E. Two uh, F. Little F. Capital right above e big F site plan. Yeah, correct. Okay. Yeah. Do these stairs meet all those requirements? Excuse me? Do these stairs meet all those requirements? No, they don't. I'd, I'd like to continue with, with uh, the, the methodology that we went through here. Um, so at that, at that time, I, uh, having done this for a number of, a number of years and a number of similar situations, I asked Bruce if we could go out to the site and just confirm that we are um, to, to confirm where the, the starting point or the beginning point of measurement for the 250-foot uh, setback would take place. Uh, he agreed to do that. We did that. Um, we stood right here. Um, 
Bruce identified the uh, exact location of the normal high tide. Uh, I then measured from that mark to the rear property line, which uh, there are a couple stakes out there, so we knew exactly where that rear property line was. And it measured 76 feet to that rear property line uh, from the normal high water line. And that note is indicated. I believe you have a copy of this plan. Uh, we then, met, we then um, identified where the 250-foot setback uh, line uh, is, and that is in this location here. Um, once we knew where the 250-foot line was, we then calculated the lot area within the 250, not the total lot, but only that lot area in accordance with the ordinance um, within the 250-foot. That lot area uh, equals 14,000 square feet. You then take the 14,000 square feet and you uh, determine the 20%, which is 2,800 square feet, is the total allowable lot coverage. I then um, placed the proposed set of stairs in the location where we're proposing to, to locate it and calculated um, the impervious surface, which includes the house, stone walls, the, the stone patio, the steps, the driveway, drip strips, etc. The entire impervious area uh, within that uh, 14,000 square feet equals 2,392 square feet, well below the 2,800 square feet allowed. Um, we then, I then calculated the impervious surface for the proposed set of stairs. That equaled 292 square feet, added it to the existing impervious surface, and it totals 2,684 square feet. And that leaves a balance of 116 square feet of additional impervious surface that could be added at a later date. Um, so I documented this all up on this plan. Um, I'm a registered landscape architect. I've done this for um, many, many similar situations uh, in Cape Elizabeth. Um, it's always been, in my, in my experience, it's always been uh, determined at the normal high tide, not the top of slope. Um, the only exception to that, there have been two exceptions, in the past in the town of Cape Elizabeth where Bruce has required us to go to the top of the slope. And that has been when the high tide, when there's more of a vertical slope and the high tide has gone to the bottom of the slope, then he has required, as well as Marine, has required us to go to the top of the slope. But never have I ever, never have I been required to go to the top of the slope when the high tide is well out from the top of the slope. And I think that's where, that may be the confusion here, um, using the normal high tide versus top of slope. Can, can I ask you a question? Did you, would you agree that if you had calculated the impervious surface on the entire lot, as it's a legal lot as opposed to 250 feet out, that it would be greater than 20%? It would be. Okay. No, I, I'm sorry. Do, from, measured from the top slope or measured from the entirety of the, the entirety of the lot in other words including the part uh, between the street and where you you took the 250 and drew your dotted line is it what, what's up there this is uh, more of garage in the driveway okay that would tip it over 20 percent correct it would okay what what's the basis for cutting it off at the 250 foot line there. I look at the definition of lot and lot area and it seems to say that you look at the a lot, a parcel of land with ascertainable boundaries described in a recorded deed or shown on an approved subdivision plan and meeting zoning requirements at the time it was created. Doesn't that mean that you need to look at the entire lot, not just the first 250 feet from the high, lot, the high line, the water? Remember, we're calculating the 20 percent. Correct. Impervious wow. surface. And I believe the ordinance states that you take as, I, as I've described, you take the area within the 250 feet, 
not the entire lot. Yeah. And that is... If you turn to the end of maximum coverage, um, at the very end, it says, the total footprint of all blah, 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 or portion thereof located within the district, including land area previously developed. So the question becomes what the portion what? of the lot within the district. But then it turns on the point that Murphy's brought up, which is that... The entire lot appears to be in the district? The, well, there's, there's the zoning map, and then there's the factual measurement of 250 feet from the... the uh, high watermark and whether or not where that 250 250 feet may lie at the end of the day as adopted in our ordinance the shoreland zone has been defined as running at a particular spot and whether factually that is 250 feet or not is does it's beyond what we can address what yeah. we can address is what it's zoned as and that entire lot it seems the Murphy's argument is is zoned as shoreland as, as shown on whether, the zoning map as shown on the zone and that the zoning map is, is one inch equals two thousand feet yeah. and we've always been told by the planning office and the code enforcement officer that th that's a general that's a general map mm -hmm. and what you do is you use a certified survey to determine where the 250 foot it, line in whether uh, go ahead does the nonconformity matter if we're not looking at 19.4-4 and instead we're looking at this F provision, which allows for stairs regardless of the provision so of the I think table? You know, I think the stairs, it sounds like, don't meet that criteria because perhaps they're too wide or some they're other. They're four inches too Right. Wide. They need to be four feet wide. There have to be no other feasible ways to get down across Does that, that apply to the whole thing? That's one. That last clause, I couldn't, I was trying to read it a couple times to see if it applied to the whole thing. But anyway, sorry, go ahead. It's, it, you know, um, Mr. Strahd, it's very similar to wetland mapping. Um, the planning office has a, a wetland map in their office, which is generalized. Um, but you always use a, a field survey to calculate wetlands and that makes sense to me and I don't want to create a Kafka situation here uh, it's just as the Murphys have observed whether right or wrong we haven't addressed this yet it does appear that the ordinance defines what the where the zones are and that if someone disagrees with the location of a boundary there's prov provisions and steps that are to be followed to alter those boundaries um, in whether they're right or wrong with that argument, that, that at least is their argument, which is what I'm just posing to you, whether I agree with it or not. Yeah, but under 19-6-11, under it says the Shoreland Performance Overlay District applies to all land within the 250 feet horizontal distance of, and then it gives three different. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, yet the map itself, though, if we go back to the location of the district boundaries, and I, I, I understand your position, and I in some ways agree with your position that, it, in a way, the, the boundaries of those zones should be def dictated by that 250 feet, but at the same time, at least the Murphy's argument, which is what I'm just putting forth, not that I don't necessarily agree right. with it or not, is that the boundaries are dictated by the map itself, and the ordinance, in fact, has provisions for where, uh, where the district boundary lines are approximately the location of exist existing property, so on and so forth, that there's provisions for modifying it where that um, right. Right. broad map is inaccurate. What about section 1910.1, conflict with other provisions? Whenever a provision of, which is on page 210-ish, whenever a provision of this ordinance conflicts with or is inconsistent with another provision of this ordinance, blah, 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 a more restrictive and specific provision shall control. I don't know whether this is applicable, but at least an argument could be made that uh, hard to discern boundary map is the, is the less specific, and if you could have a 250 foot. Well, but that's more restrictive. It, it understood, it's, it, that, that's where I'm having a problem. It gets more specific, but possibly less restrictive, so I'm not sure that this works well, the, either. The, I mean, the map. If, if we're going by the map, the it's map more is restrictive. more restrictive right. of the development. But less specific. Less specific. Right. So, right. Correct. I, I don't know. I, I, I throw it out there. As... Mr. Wall, do you have any, any guidance for us on when we have a conflict between? Well, I think you'd first have to really determine that there is a conflict. And um, um, 
I'm looking for the, and you may want to inquire of the Murphys whether they can point to the, the provision in, incorporated to the map where it says that the 250 is measured from the top of the bank as opposed to the normal high, high water mark. Um, they, they perhaps have, have that to hand that they could, they could tell you that might assist you in being able to determine whether or not, in fact, there is a conflict. Yeah, I, I just look at 1924 um, as the, the Murphys touched upon where it says, where uncertainty exists as to the location of any zoning district boundary, the property owner, owner so affected may request in writing that the CEO make a formal written determination as to the boundary, which I guess uh, to play devil's advocate now in your favor would be that the argument is that this is in fact an implicit finding as to where the boundary is because of the fact that there is a finding that it would not exceed the lot coverage after presenting this argument that you've right. raised to us to the CEO. Right. And had you finished your explanation of the presentation you gave to I have. Members? I have. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. You want to say something? I do want to cover, I'm David Tureski, and I've been asked by um, Mr. Goldman to be here this evening. I provided you folks uh, this afternoon with a position paper that I think was paper that was referred to in the earlier uh, hearing involving the Livingstons and uh, I think I hope that our position is set forth fairly clearly there and uh, as we've talked about tonight there are two issues I do want to indicate that we've asked uh, Jim Fisher to stay on and uh, if you folks want to take his testimony again uh, we would do that but I want to offer just that uh, he would reaffirm the testimony that he gave in the other matter. I'm not sure how we have to develop a record, if you think it's necessary to develop a record. Otherwise, I'd propose to incorporate by reference what he said and that he, I think that he is also, while he was uh, surveying the Livingston's lot, he certainly looked at and knows of our lot. Our lot sits higher than the Livingston's lot. So the uh, top of the cliff is even, uh, or the top of the bank is even more uh, farther removed from the normal high water mark than is the case uh, for the Livingston. So uh, I'd be glad to have uh, Mr. Fisher come up and reaffirm that if that's the pleasure of, of or the board uh, feels that's necessary. I don't want to not do that and then not, have, not preserve an adequate record. So I wanted to get that. So I think 7-0 you folks adopted, I think, the findings, his testimony. And I would ask that you do that in, in this case to establish that the line is, as John Mitchell indicated, uh, the mean high water mark or the normal high water mark is well below the uh, top of the cliff. So I don't have much more to say on that particular issue since I think much has already been said. And I think that as uh, Mr. Mitchell uh, pointed out that in the case of the coverage or overage issue uh, we are using uh, the definition of the quote district which is set forth in the grid in my book, I think it was, sorry. In my book, it's uh, page 139, and that the term here, the total footprint of 20 feet, not 20, the 20% 20 standard uh, that uh, you folks have been dealing with, at the end of it, it says located within the district, and here I would take that term to mean the district would be the shoreland zoning district because that's the subpart that if you re go two pages or three pages earlier, it says shoreland performance over a district. So it's 19611. And so as I think that Mr. Mitchell's testimony was that uh, when he measured this, he, was, he stayed within, do I have that right, that you stayed within that district? Yeah, okay. Um, I just want to go back to what Mr. Mitchell was talking about earlier in his conversations with the code enforcement officer. And what I was hearing was that the code enforcement officer took the position that the stairway was authorized under this sub F provision. And was there documentation regarding 
the criteria of this paragraph, subparagraph F was anything additional submitted beyond just this plan. Unfortunately, I don't have the whole file, so all I have is this from what was submitted. So to what the extent other stuff was submitted on the other criteria in that section, I'd be curious to hear what well, that was. It, it's, it's our desire to build these set of stairs wider than four feet. And did you talk about that with the code enforcement officer? Yes, we did. And and they, I mean, they're, they're clearly outside the 75-foot setback, uh, shoreland setback. So we, um, the, the permit application that was approved will allow us to do that. Because it's outside the 75 feet under your position and the lot coverage is not exceeded That's under correct. your position. Correct. So therefore, the subsection F uh, exception is inapplicable. It, and it's permitted anyway. It's permitted anyways, but we'd, we'd like to build it wider than just four feet wide. And did you submit any or have any discussions with the code enforcement officer about whether there were other reasonable alternatives for getting down there? Um, I'm not sure that we, I mean, we, we went out there together. Uh, this, this is a very steep embankment. I mean, it's, it's almost a 45 degree um, slope that uh, the only way to get to from this upper level to the lower level is by way of a set of stairs. Is the soil stable? Yes, it is. I wanted to add uh, just one a response to uh, Andre's a point that uh, in some way we get stuck with the original survey the 2005 survey. I think that we have entered into evidence uh, Mr. Mitchell's survey or additional survey onto that Titcom survey. So we are seeking and have been seeking for as long as he's filed this with Bruce Smith to revise that. I don't think there's anything in the ordinances or otherwise that prevent us or preclude us from appropriately revising the survey. Uh, also, you have a letter from Bruce Smith who is not here and I guess under the ordinance who's whose absence is supposed to be excused. I'm not sure by whom, but anyhow, he's not here. And at the end of this uh, email, I guess, or letter to Michael McGovern, uh, which is, let's see, I have to look at the date, October 23, it's today, uh, sometime in the morning. He talks about, I think, uh, the survey and how he did not focus on this line of what constituted the cliff. He was concerned, as I understand the matter, when he approved this plan originally, simply with, uh, uh, have, making sure the house sat well away from the cliff. He was assured of that. He wasn't paying much attention, as I understand it, to where exactly the lot started. So that was not a matter of any concern. And that's what I think he indicated to Mr. Mitchell. So uh, he was not uh, buying into necessarily uh, where, the, uh, where the lot started uh, in terms of whether it started, started at the cliff or started well below the cliff. So, you know, we think that at least on the, issue, the, the first issue, uh, that was raised by the Murphys that uh, we see no reason why the, the board here should not be deciding the matter consistently as it decided with uh, the Livingstons. And we do have, again, Mr. Fisher here to testify if you wish. Is there anything more on that extra four inches? Four feet. Four feet. It's, well, they're four feet, four inches, right? No, it's eight feet across, right? I think we, that section allow limits you. Oh, it's four right. feet on both sides of and the this, dividing this line. Proposes Sorry. It's eight feet right all together in width. Plus the sidewalls. Plus the sidewalls. So, so uh, okay, so we're, 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 we're kind of citing this section F as, as the escape hatch, if you will, for in terms of what the code enforcement officer cited. Officer cited. But th then we, at least from what I'm hearing, we're coming back to whether. Well, there's kind of a variance on the four feet. It's going to be eight feet or something like that. And, and, and so we're defaulting to is the, is the area of coverage, you know, under or over the 20 percent, you know, uh, threshold for a nonconforming lot. So, I mean, to, to me, I mean, are we back, are we really trying to decide is, is the addition here with, within the 20 percent variance or not? I don't think we have to go there if we're looking at F. 
But, but if I we're guess going to I, I'm saying on F, we'd have to go back to the four feet. And right. I guess I'm trying to look but for that's information. Not, on that's not what the, I mean. The permit wasn't issued for four feet. It was issued for right. eight. Right. right. Which is why I don't see which how you can. Couldn't be. Under I don't this. think we can. Yeah. You can't use F. Right. So, but they potentially could have. But in this situation, unless they wanted to say they'd be happy with four feet. <laughs> <laughs> right. And there was a conclusion. Then I don't think we need a permit. Would we need a permit at all under those circumstances? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. It would be four feet and the uh, conclusion that um, it was required because of steep slopes or unstable soils. Okay. Right. I mean, but, but again, because the permit was issued and it was eight feet, it, it, it isn't. Right. The per yeah, the permit as issued and doesn't that's fit within the four corners of right. staff. And that's what's before the board is the permit that was issued. So that then it right. turns on how we calculate lot. Si uh, the lot coverage, right. do we use the boundary as right. in the very um, high level zoning map, or do we measure it based on 250 feet from the. Is it measure 20 something? if we just look at the front face? Do we get to say anything, or do I get crippled standing here? <laughs> well, you get your chance, but we're here. We'll from hear the from parties. the parties. We'll hear from the parties first. Um, I get. I guess I was asking whether the lot coverage is less than 20% in either of those scenarios. It, it's less than 20% in the John in John Mitchell's drawing. Okay. The, it, in front I, of that. In front of exactly. Line, with what's so, in red. Yeah. So I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm Marshall Goldman, 27 Pilot Point Road. It's nice to be here um, this evening. Yet. I don't believe that for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, try that. Cape Elizabeth is a very nice town, and we're very for we're very very fortunate. We're we're very fortunate to be here, and and, and uh, we're very fortunate to have a home um, uh, with uh, really a, a very nice neighborhood, and um, with a nice um, view of the ocean. And uh, all we wanted to do was put some steps um, on our property, not in the easement. On our property, so we could get down to the ocean easily. That's that's the basic intent. Uh, I understand. I, I know that there has to be a hangover from uh, the previous uh, 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 discussion, even though you know we're all human beings. Um, but if you were to look at this uh, strictly on the uh, merits and on the basis of the de decision that you made. Uh, previously, and imagine that that would have been made 30 days ago. Um, you basically made a decision that said that the high water mark is where the ocean is. I can tell you that um, you know I go down to the ocean every day, and I look at it, and I and you, it's very clear. You all were out at the uh, you know at the uh, Livingston's uh, property, and you saw that as well. I mean that's that's where the ocean begins, and I think that's pretty clear. Um, John Mitchell. Um, did a very uh, thorough job. I, I don't know what more we could have done, honestly. We met with Bruce once, um, talked with him, found out what the requirements were of the town. Uh, we did everything we could to determine that. John Mitchell has vast experience in Cape Elizabeth as well. We met with him on the site to verify again and this is the process that we used when we built our house, by the way. I mean, we were very, very concerned uh, that we do things properly in the town. Um, and uh, we've met with, we met with John a couple times, uh, with uh, Bruce twice. He gave us a determination. Uh, the Murphys, um, uh, with all due respect, are searching for uh, an argument to to basically justify their appeal. I mean, I didn't hear anything, but I'm not an attorney, so I, I don't want to presume that I would, you know, you know, know this, but it didn't, I didn't hear them come up with a reason why the code enforcement officer did not have the power to do this. Um, the other point is I understand that um, uh, it's uh, proper and uh, correct for anybody in the town to file an appeal on any permit whatsoever. That's fine. We don't have a problem with that. And we have not begun construction. We wanted to wait because we felt we don't want to do anything that's wrong. Uh, but what I do have a little bit of a problem with is understanding how this damages them. 
they cannot see these steps from their house. The steps are not in the easement that we have, have had this discussion about in the previous case. They're not even close to it. They're on our property. We've calculated the lot coverage based on the traditional method in which it's been done in Cape Elizabeth, and the code enforcement officer has blessed that. It seems like there would be a high, have to be a high standard. You know, the um, city attorney mentioned a couple standards that I think are important, and I've, I didn't write them down. But it seemed there were high standards to meet to deny us the ability to go ahead with this project. Would we be willing to cooperate with the city in any way? Absolutely. We don't have a problem with that. But we don't think that it would be fair at this point. Um, it, we're, we're sorry that it, it, it has taken so much of your time. Because I know everybody, you know, I have actually done work like you have done, and I know it's very difficult and it takes a lot of time. Um, but we really, uh, it's really very important to us that we think we're on very firm ground. We don't think there's been a case that's been presented to the contrary. And we've done everything we could to obtain the blessing of the city. So I appreciate your, your listening. I appreciate all your desire to meet all the requirements. However, if you do check on this, you'll find the building is like 15 feet too high. Um, the, you brought it up. The, uh, the size, is, it's, it's way too big. The lot coverage definitely is there. If we look at what the zoning says, and we look at the official map of the town, how are we as townspeople supposed to say, well, no matter what it says in here, no matter what our town officials say, no matter what our planning people say who wrote the ordinance, that's all to be ignored because it really doesn't matter what they say or even what's in the ordinance. Doesn't the ordinance say 250 feet? So we're not really ignoring the ordinance if we decide to go that way. It says the 250-foot zone as shown in this map, which is specifically there, it, the entire the lot map? is in that zone. I, we have a copy. We zoomed that straight from the ordinance. It's the official map of the town. We didn't draw it. We didn't t you know, fix it in any way. And the entire lot is shown within that 250-foot thing. And it doesn't say, as measured from the high tide or whatever. It says, this is the zone. Okay. When we look at that, with the whole lot in there, he's admitted that it exceeds the 20%. His own evidence shows that you have to find that this exceeds the thing and can't be done. Plus, does the building inspector have the power to vary the ordinance? I think you said it said four feet and they're going eight feet. Does he have the power to give a variance to people? It's not a variance as, de as defined in here. It's a separate section. And does it require that they be four feet? It specifies four feet in that section, yes. Okay, it, so that's it, the it, it also specifies that it's a code enforcement officer decision. And, and that section is not before the board. Because that, that But the wasn't steps are, approved. right? S steps and that's are. part of this permit that we're reviewing, <coughs> is it not? Right, but, but the... But the specific section with respect to the steps isn't before the board because the permit that was issued is outside the scope of that section because he approved eight feet okay. steps, not four feet steps. We're with you on this one. <laughs> the, okay. On the steps. But least, the appeal. At least, at least provisional. This is an appeal of an administrative decision, is it not? Is that my understanding? In an appeal of an administrative decision, and again, 
uh, I may have New Hampshire laws different from Maine, but the board sits in place of the building inspector and has all of his powers and authority at the time. Doesn't happen in Maine that way? Not exactly. We talked about the standard of review earlier. It's quasi de novo, I believe, Mr. Walsh, correct? In, in either way, the, the, the stairs that have been proposed do not fall into that. So we don't have to worry about whether it applies or not, fortunately. Well, it still is part of the lot coverage because it's impermeable surfaces. Which is the, the issue is how do we calculate the, the lot coverage? Well, in, I don't know that I agree with that, but, okay. but that's kind Fair of enough. beside the Fair enough, from my you know, perspective. The questions to my mind that are still open are A, standing, and B, where we are on what argument the Murphys, have, who are the only party that timely appealed, have presented from the ordinance that indicate that this permit was improperly issued. Well, doesn't it say that under your maximum coverage for the site, under all uses, that it can't exceed 20 percent? It does, but as we've talked about, in all of these appeals, there are also provisions in the ordinance that allow for circumstances where nonconformance may continue, be enlarged, et cetera, et cetera. Just speak to that point, because it, it is our appeal, and, um, and, and, I, and just so for the record, uh, if you look at section uh, page 44 under 1944 C1 expansions, expansions of non conforming uses are prohibited except that non conforming residential uses may be expanded within existing residential structures and within expansions of such structures as permitted by section 1944 B1. I'll get there in a minute. Uh, expansions after obtaining a permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. So that, I think that was going to your issue. How do we, how do we get That's to? an expansion of a non-conforming use? Yeah. yeah, and I would say we have a non-conforming use here, and we're expanding okay. on that. That's, is an expansion and creation different? What's the non-conforming I don't think you can create a more non-conforming use. The non-conforming use here is, is the fact that you're creating a, a uh, expansion of the impervious service over 20, That's not 20 percent. Okay. Uh, again, I recognize that, Joanna, you and I are going to disagree on that point. Then if you go to 1944B1, uh, enlargement, which is, this is kind of where it was get, where the re brought you back to, a non-conforming structure may be added to or expanded after obtaining a permit from the code enforcement driver, provided that such addition or expansions does not increase the non-conformity of the structure. So we don't have that here. So that's, that's, for the record, that's where we get us to recognize that. And why don't we have that here? Can you speak to that a little more? What's that? Why don't we have that here? Can you speak what? to um, B1 a little bit more? Certainly. So the question is, is why don't we have... Uh, you read the first section, B1, and said we don't have that here. Because what we have is an increase of the nonconformity. How so? The, for the reasons I just stated, but I'll state them again. That you have a, uh, an expansion of the impervious service, and then you, uh, and then and again, I, I suspect I'm going to lose on this point, but you also have a structure going within the 75 foot setback. Okay. So, so is your argument that the expansion and the non conformity. It's a non conforming use. You're expanding the, the non conforming use. Well, wait. On the non-conforming structure, the enlargement of a non-conforming structure under 944B1, are you saying that the code enforcement officer could not have issued this permit because the expansion um, by construction of the stairs um, increases the non-conformity, that being the lot coverage? Correct. Okay. So Thanks. obviously it's your appeal, not mine, but from my perspective, B1 you, you don't have the ability to add a structure that's, right. th this is a totally different structure, so it wouldn't qualify under B1 to add these stairs. Right. To me, so it seems like. It's creation, not enlargement. Exactly. It's, to me, it falls under f uh, five, but um, I could be wrong. For five? Roughly page 44, it's section 944B. In my head, it's 43 non to 44. Yeah. Entitled Non-Conforming Accessory Structures. But that, I mean, that. But again, this all turns on lot coverage to me. That's 
my position. Right. Right. Thank you. I just put you back to B1. I mean, and I, I just don't think it fits in B1. I just want to follow up on a couple of comments that were made by board members, and that is, I think that given the um, con some confusion that I've heard uh, all over here over how you define district for the purpose of the 250 feet or where you start, that uh, I would go back to, I think, what uh, John Wall read to us as the standards for review, and at least the first one, and correct me if I'm wrong, was whether Bruce Smith's decision was clearly contrary to the ordinance. It doesn't seem to me why there's some question about, uh, because there's some question about what the ordinance is, it seems that his decision, which was to grant this permit, to grant this permit, and to issue the permit was then not clearly contrary to the definition or the terms of the ordinance. And I think I spelled out where in this box uh, we define the term district to mean the shoreland, uh, the shoreland zoning or the shoreland uh, overlay district. That's number one. Number two is um, that, uh, as my client has indicated, that uh, none of the neighbors, including the Murphys here, can even see uh, the stairwell that we contemplate. Uh, uh, it is obscured or whatever it is by the, the house, and, uh, it, and given the slope of the land, no one is going to see it. Uh, no one really has access to it or will have access because it's well away from the paper road or the right of way, Surfside Avenue. And so uh, to respond, and, and I certainly raised this in my uh, initial writings, uh, my submission to you folks was, uh, and I think this deals again with Ms. Uh, Ms. Taranjo's point about that there may not be any standing, there may not be any grievance here, uh, any problem. There certainly isn't any obstruction of view created by the stairwell. This is a very small, ornamental, uh, large, you know, somewhat ornamental, somewhat functional project that the Goldmans uh, have contemplated. And as Marshall indicated, uh, he certainly did the right thing, which is he's waited, waited for the appeal period, he got his permit, uh, he waited for the appeal period, and he's here. And uh, you know there has been there has been no construction. So uh, you know we see this as a very small project, one that's going to enhance his uh, living where he does, and not have any adverse effect upon any of the abutters or neighbors. And whether those people are over here, as the Murphys are high up on this, or whether people are walking through uh, Surfside Avenue, as I understand it, there are very few people who ever walk through that right of way. Uh, so I just wanted to make those comments. Thank you. I move to close public comment. Is that comment? Sure. Sorry, we're trying to... What? My name is Bob Cronin. I live at 7 Avon Road in the Shore Acres. Uh, I served on the board uh, a number of years, and we've wrestled with a lot of these same problems you have. And when the issue of top of the bank versus uh, extreme, uh, extreme effect of the tides, uh, the argument that was brought before, but I think it was cogent, was that the top of the bank is necessarily coincidental with the extreme effect of the tides because the top of the bank has not eroded away. It's top of the bank because it has eroded away beneath the bank. What er that erosion occurred as an effect of what? You could say wind and you can say rain, but it's most likely tides. So the, there's not a difference between maximum effect of the tides and top of the bank. Um, whatever the, the facts may be with regard to that or the uh, uh, geology, certain, the main Supreme Court, and again, in, in the case that involves Prundy Point, the Mad case from 1983 that people have talked about from time to time, says, it, in matter of fact, uh, it's Judge Godfrey who says that there's the mistake between the id est and the ex gradia, but this is just an example of, it's a really an e.g. rather than an i.e., it's an example of. And so what you do is you look at the site and you make a determination. And I would say in all fairness, the main Supreme Court, or I think that the, uh, the, the board here in the, in the Mac case found that uh, on that particular point of land, which was quite low, is that the tides were, were up above, actually, the, uh, the cliff. So, but that's not the case here. 
math is a case that, I'm just going to say, it's good, it's good and bad for, for, for us and for everyone else because it, it really uh, sustained the, uh, the zoning board, but it sustained it in a way that, that said that, uh, and sustained it in a way that said that the cliff is simply an example or the top of the beach is an example. It's not determinate. I want to get back to why, make a statement about why there's a concern about impervious surfaces in the shoreland zone. There is a reason why you don't want to exceed 20 percent, correct? And that reason is because of the runoff that goes into the ocean and into the food we eat. These laws weren't set up just to annoy people that live on the coastline. There's a reason for it. So if you're expanding that non-conforming structure by in adding impervious surface, I would say that you need the zoning board to take a peek at that. And I do say that I'm very concerned about the zoning map because I think it is, the law is entirely in that. And on the CAPE's comprehensive plan, all of this was taken into account. If you, if you don't, do anything. You have to look at that 250 foot as it's d defined on the map, and you can't, I don't believe that the zoning board can change that. It's, it's an official document. It's part of the ordinance. It would require an amendment. It's not, and I think that these shore owners, when these properties, from what Maureen had told me in the past, People received letters that told them how much, what they had, how much of their lot was in the shoreland zone. This lot was in the shoreland zone entirely. So, but it, thank you very much. Thanks. I would like to reiterate what was said earlier that two active town officials and also one former planning board member has told us that the starting point of measure for the shoreland zone and the coastal wetland setback is at the top of the bank. And they added, always has been, always will be. Thank you. Move to close uh, the record at this point. Second. Start a second. Second. All in favor? I think we need to talk logistics here, guys. We're coming up on 11 o'clock. Um, I don't know what the board's thoughts are about. We're definitely not going to finish all four of them tonight. I just don't see any way that we're going to do that. Um, what, how much more, if any, we want to do tonight? I'm fairly agnostic about it. I'm tired, but... Um, My opinion is at a minimum we should finish at least this one tonight. Okay. I'd agree. At a minimum we should finish this, this uh, appeal tonight. But logistics? logistics? Yes. Obviously, you know, we understand it's late. This is the second hearing the Livingstons have had to come to, the second hearing where they've had to hire, hire an attorney uh, to come to. So we're just concerned that we put it off again. We're adding additional expense. Um, so we'd like the board to consider that. In light of that as well, I think at least one of the appeals, which is the deck permit, has an issue of timeliness since it is almost a year late. I would I hope that that would be quick. I don't presume what your decision is going to be, but I'm just I'm, I'm throwing out things for the board to consider. I, uh, not to interrupt, but I, I would propose we finish with this issue and at that point then play it by ear, play it by ear as to how quickly okay. we can finish this issue. Okay. And then. Well, and then, then the other point that I'd like to, I mean, I, we'd, we'd obviously like to get to all of them. I, I Believe me, I know about the time. Uh, with respect to the second appeal, which is another appeal of the patio permit, um, we've had Jim Fisher come here, and he's testified. And uh, I'd like to have his testimony from that appeal carry over and be part, become part of the record of the next of the, the patio appeal, even if that patio appeal is not heard tonight, so that we don't have to pay for Jim to come back. At a minimum, I mean, obviously we would prefer to get it done, but at a minimum, we we would very much like 
to have that happen. And I would hope that the, the representative from Shore Acres would be willing to agree to that, which I think would make the issue not one that you'd need to even worry about. But I, at a minimum, I'd like to see, see that happen uh, to you know, just try to stop this. I mean, it's dragged on a long time now. And, and, and is, is the November meeting in Thanksgiving week? Does it mean that you'll go to December? Or is it your house on Thanksgiving? <laughs> I'm sure. I, I believe there'll be a meeting. Well, that, that, that makes an easy commute for me. Um, okay. Well, okay. That, that's, that's, we, I just I, wanted I to raise appreciate this. the comments, and, and, and they're, they're well taken. We understand. You know, we're not, it's not our intent here to drag this out anymore. Trust me, any more than we have to. Uh, all right. Well, then why don't we, let's, let's finish this one and see where we are at that point. I'll start on this one if we're ready then. So from my perspective, as I've kind of hinted at a number of times here, it all turns on where we define the boundaries of the shoreland zone in order to come up with the 20% uh, coverage calculation. And I, I agree with the Murphys and from the perspective of why does this exist? Why is this issue even here today? And to some extent, the shoreland protection zone says we, we only are going to permit 20% lot coverage for, as they noted, we want to prevent runoff going into the water system. So we, we don't have a precise way or the state doesn't have a precise way to say for every single lot what's happening on this lot, how much runoff is there going to be into the water body. So what we have are these rough measurements, these rough uh, tools that we use which say we are not going to allow more than 20% lot coverage so that the water, the runoff is absorbed into the ground, into the soil, and we don't have the phosphates running into the water. So that's the reason why this exists. The 20% is we're trying to protect the water body. And the reason why we're here today is because of the fact that you're, the, the lot at issue here, the coverage is close to that 20%. We're, we are ever so close to that 20%. If it was at 5%, if it was at 10%, this would be a lot easier. But we, we are very close to that, that 20%, which is why where we define this boundary does matter. And I hear what the Murphys are saying with 1924 says the boundaries of the above districts are as shown on the zoning map, it, period. It, it is as defined on the zoning map. I also hear the argument, well, you know, the, the zoning map, it's not very granular. This is a very high level, but nevertheless, it has drawn, a, draw, a boundary has been drawn, and the ordinance says this is the boundary, and that boundary is in the street from looking at the map when I look at it. And because of that, if one were to go to the, the code enforcement officer or come up with some other uh, 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 avenue to say where is the actual uh, boundary of the zoning district, we do not believe that as depicted on this map. It's accurate. We believe that it should have been at this location because that's where the 250 feet are. That would be one, that would be a different issue than here where that has not necessarily occurred. The argument would be that it implicitly occurred by the granting of the, the, the permit, but I, I don't think that necessarily happened here. I think the code enforcement officer said the way that I'm going to measure this is I look at what's 250 feet from the high water line, which to me is at this location. That is a slightly different decision than saying the, the um, the zoning map line is here and therefore th this percentage of the lot is within the, the shoreland zone and this percentage is not. The zoning map to me, and again, clear air, whatever the standard is, but I look at the zoning map and it's clear this entire lot is in the shoreland zone. Whether it should have been de uh, designed that way or not, whether historically the high water mark was from the cliff edge, that, that's what people kind of roughly looked at, whether anyone actually ever came in and said, it's actually at this location looking at the, the high tide. And one of the commenters uh, observed that, oh, his, the erosion occurs because of tide, but as we had discussed in the prior uh, appeal, the question is which tide? Is it the storm tide? Is it a um, uh, uh, hurricane tide that came in or the regular tide? And, at least my position was that it's regular tide. And regular tide did not reach up to cause that erosion from my perspective looking at it. To sum up though, from my position, the, uh, from my, my view is that we de determine how much is in the zone by looking at the map. Looking at the map, the entire lot is in the zone. Accordingly, we have to use that calculation. And to me, you could potentially go by way of the code enforcement officer to get a decision that says, oh, this where it's drawn is not accurate, but that's not before us. So because of that, I'm inclined to say that it, this exceeds the 20% and therefore we, the, the permit cannot be granted. 
And I mean, again, we're applying this, this standard of clearly contrary and unsupported by the record. So I mean, isn't that what we need to be focused on? I mean, we have the map and we have the measurement and, and they're clearly at odds. I, I mean, I don't think there's actually any factual dispute here. I think it's a, it's a legal issue of what is operative here. Is it the map or is it the measurement? And I mean, I, I'm, I'm still struggling with it, um, but I mean, I'd like to look back at, you know, clearly, clearly contrary. My intuition or I, what, my feeling is that how can it be clearly contrary if you can read it two different ways? I mean, reasonable minds can differ as to which applies. So, I mean, I, I agree that this says, the map says this, but there's also language in the ordinance specifying the 250 feet. And Bruce even cited in his email that, that he was relying upon the survey in, in making his determination. So. I mean, we, we can basis. And, and we can find language in the ordinance to back that up, to support his decision. I guess what I'm struggling with in this section 19-2-4, the location of district boundaries, is that the specificity for the requirement for the zoning map applies to situations where the um, the location of the boundaries is defined by a detailed description. And the shoreland zone is different from other districts in that it's 250 feet back from a point somewhat uncertain, if you will. And so to the extent that point somewhat uncertain changes, it seems to me that we're in this category of a degree of confusion and um, that this kind of starting point can change. Um, And so that getting to a place where you're saying that the standard for overturning the code enforcement officer's decision is met based on a standard that is not defined in the ordinance seems hard to me. I guess I'm... Uh, uh it is an administrative appeal, and, and I think for, for that reason, I mean, our, our job is to look to see whether the actions of the code enforcement officer were, were correct in this instance. And, and I'm not sure on the one hand that, again, I think he relied upon a survey. I think that was the basis of his granting of the permit. I don't think we, we clearly have conflicting data, but I don't think he's what was necessarily um, he had a basis for his decision. Um, so it's hard on that basis to, to overturn his decision. Um, I, I am a little troubled with, you know, I, I, I do think the lot is, is, is probably, is in the, in the shoreline district area and, and I have a bit of an issue with only taking a part of that lot and calculating the 20% as opposed to the whole lot. I, mean, I think the lot's either in or it's not. And, um, you know, from my perspective, it's, um, I, I think that entire lot needs to be taken into account for purposes of the calculation. And when you do that, I think as, as uh, Mr. Mitchell mentioned, it's probably when you include the, the uh, structures that are outside of that area, I think it's, it's over the 20%. Um, so I, I guess I'm, as I'm listening to the arguments from people up here, and I guess I'm pretty much on pretty much on the fence on this one. <laughs> I, I think I, I disagree a little with, with, with uh, some of my fellow board members here because you know, the, first, the first line of section 1924 says the boundaries of the above districts are shown on the zoning map. And I think we're all in agreement that the zoning map shows the entirety of the Golden Lot being in the Shoreline District. So I'd be inclined to say that uh, issuance of the permit was clearly contrary to the ordinance. Now, I, 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 I don't disagree that there's certainly an argument to be made the other way, but I think that I, I'm inclined to vote to the extent on that conclusion that, that we're going to ask about that, that we're going to vote on that, that, that uh, issuance of the permit was clearly contrary to the ordinance here. Um, and I think it follows from that, at least from my perspective, that 
if that is the case, then you need to include the entirety of the lot in the calculation and um, the impermeable area is already was greater than 20 percent when you include the additional house and parking uh, driveways at the, at the northern end or the, or, or the upper end of the lot. So um, I'm not sure that this permit should have been issued. I mean, in 19.611, which is discussing the Shoreland Performance Overlay District, there's language in here, the Shoreland Performance Overlay District applies to all land within 250 feet horizontal distance of the <laughs> normal high water, et cetera. Isn't that, I mean, isn't that defining, isn't that, a, isn't that someplace else in the ordinance that is defining the Shoreland District? Yes. I mean, it, it's, it, I mean, is I guess I'm I'm I'm, I'm trying to reconcile these t the language in in these two <coughs> sections. I'm trying to determine whether or not there is a true conflict in the language between these two sections in the right. ordinance. Right, and uh, it's the, the, what I'm struggling with as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess we could default back to that that catch-all provision at the back that says we're going to go with the more restrictive one. And where is that again? Um, it's right at the very end. Um, 1910-1. But again, we have that language, the more restrictive and specific. But we would say that the going by the map is more restrictive, <laughs> but going by the 250 foot is more specific. So what the heck do we do with that? Um, to continue, well, was, Bruce, was Bruce's decision supported by substantial evidence? It seems like there's two different provisions that. Yes. It yeah. seems like one provision that he's one provision that you read it, it doesn't fit, but the other one it does. Is that clearly contrary? Yeah. Is it clearly contrary or not supported by substantial evidence? You know, it's not a. The, the, the two provisions, you have one that's one way, the other one is a, you know, a default. Right. It's, a, it's another one that can be read that it fits. You know, whether, whether, I just think about this, what's the standard, what are we supposed to, what is the standard of review? And was his decision, you know, clearly contrary? Unsubstantiated, or excuse me, unsupported. Was it unsupported? Yeah. By substantial evidence. Yeah. So. Well, I, mean, I, I see where it, I see where it fits. I mean, I see your I see your point. I mean, it, it does say specifically the map. But then right. Look but at another provision, well, it's can't can't you harmonize them this way by saying that 1924 says the map controls. 19611 says regardless of what the map says, at the very least is going to be 250 feet. It may be more than that on the map, but it's going to set a baseline of 250 feet along the water. And as shown on the map, it may be larger in some places and smaller than others. I mean, is that, isn't that a way we could harmonize these two? But I mean, are, are you re, are you, aren't you reading language into that that's not there? Well, I don't know. Well, I'm not are, sure we have a choice, the, and we have two clearly contrary. That's the 19-2-4 language that I was talking about. That's the um, in cases in which the loca it's the last sentence of the first paragraph in 19-2-4, which is on page 24. Sorry, in my ordinance. So maybe 22 or 23 in older ones. Um, in cases in which the locations of boundaries is not defined by detailed description at the time of enactment. Such locations shall be sorry, shall be determined yep. by the distances in feet when given on. I guess what I'm getting at is the description that we have of the shoreland zone is 250 feet from the high water line. And that's what is shown on this map. And so can that fall within this section 9-2-4 language for a definition of the boundary? I mean, so the, are you saying that that's defaulting back to the map? I guess what I'm saying is that 
it seems like the map rules where there are clearly defined district boundaries, that those are clearly spelled out at the time that the map is put there, but where those boundaries are not clearly defined, where there's something like 250 feet from the mean high water line, that you then have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis to figure out where that zone is. Well, when, you well, look at, when you look at the map, though, it, there's no doubt that it encompasses the entirety of the lot, so I don't think we need to, I, I understand what you're saying, but I, I don't think, you know, there are some, there are some lots in here where it looks like the, it's the, kind the, of on the, the line. district doesn't track exactly along or, or even very near the boundary, but this one, clearly the, the entirety of it is within the Shoreland District, so. Any other, and, and I, the standard of review, I mean, I, I guess I have a little bit of trouble with calling it quasi de novo, but then applying this clearly contrary, which to me doesn't sound de novo no. to me. Is that, that's, that's what it is? That's the standard. That's the standard. Okay. <laughs> you know, the fact is that this doesn't fit clearly <coughs> contrary is the standard, I guess, but none of these, you know, we're struggling to find a standard that it clearly violates. <laughs> we're struggling to find one that it clearly fits. Um, you know, the, that F standard, which was the one that the code enforcement officer cited when he was talking to the applicant, you know, clearly we're outside that because mm -hmm. of the eight feet. It just, there's not one that in the, and that would certainly still be available in the future. Um, it's, remind me of the standard again. <laughs> Is it, was the issuance of the permit clearly contrary to the ordinance? Was the issuance of the permit unsupported by substantial evidence in the record? I mean, with, with that standard, I, I have a hard time saying that the issuance of the permit was in, improper. Okay. Well, then, you know, I think then maybe we should just bring it down to a vote. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my only additional comment would be that, um, as David had, had observed, the shoreland zone can be interpreted that it sets a base, uh, minimum baseline and that the map itself goes beyond what's defined in feet in the ordinance to further define what the zone is and that they can be harmonized. In that way. But, the, but then we have this language that specifically says in the ordinance that it's within 250 feet. Uh, the shoreland district applies to all land within 250 feet, but it doesn't say only to land within right. 250 feet. Could. That's true. All right. Well, why don't we why don't we do some findings of fact? And again, we're going to have to f feel our way through these a little bit, guys, um, and and see where that takes us. Okay. Um, findings of fact: One, Maynard and Deborah Murphy own the property at 24 Pilot Point Road, and they reside there. The Murphy's property is almost directly across the street from the subject property. All in favor? Two, on August 17, 2012, Pilot Point LLC filed an application for a building permit with the code enforcement officer seeking a permit for construction of a new accessory structure at 27 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 70. All in favor? On August 17, 2012, code enforcement officer issued a building permit number one. 30036 to Pilot Point LLC for construction of a new accessory structure at 27 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 70. All in favor? Are you not in favor, Joanne? I'm thinking, sorry. That's okay. Um, yes. Okay, all in favor. Four, on September 17, 2012, the Murphys filed with the Code Enforcement Officer an appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals challenging the issuance of building permit number 130036. All in favor? And I'll, I'll just note for the record that that was timely filed because the 30th day fell on a Sunday. Uh, additional findings of fact. Um, why, don't, why don't we, want, I'd suggest that we look at the, uh, the high water line issue first. Um, something that we we dealt with last time. We got to. I think we need to deal with it here, one way or the other. 
Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, can, if I could suggest, you might want to start with the factual finding concerning the standing question before okay. we proceed to. Right. Is that a, a stand, is that a finding of fact or is that a conclusion? It, it would be both. It would be both. Okay. A finding. Okay. As okay. to as to the requisite harm required. Right. Okay. <coughs> um, then we'll have a finding of fact, uh, proposed finding of fact, that the Murphys have demonstrated the required quantum of harm um, to have standing to object to the issuance of this permit. All in favor? Four. All right. Um. Did you have any opposed versus state? What's that? We should, you should also ask who opposes versus who abstains. Right. Uh, did, did you get the nitpicky. Did you get the votes on that on that last one? All, right. all three were no's. All three were all three no's. Okay. Why don't we going forward? If if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to assume it's a no unless you let me know otherwise. Um, um, a proposed finding of fact, uh, the, the proposed accessory structure um, is greater than 75 feet from the normal high water line of coastal waters. All in favor? Um, and then here's where we get into the, the sticky one. Yes, please do. Uh, the entirety of uh, lot uh, U12, uh, the entirety of U12 lot 70 lies within the shoreland. Shoreland zoning. Overland. District. Overlay. Sure. Start from the top again. The entirety of U12 lot 70 lies within the shoreland zoning district overlay. All in favor? Is it unanimous? Yeah. I guess we need to have. Uh, findings of fact about the impervious area, the area of impermeability, correct? So. The impervious area of the lot exceeds 20%. How about uh, the total impervious area of the lot uh, in, its current, in its current status exceeds 20%? And then we'll have a follow-up one. What's the current status? At, at, with, without the new permit, without the new stairs being built. I don't recall if we had that actual factor, yeah, if it was it just is. with the stairs, it exceeds 20%. No, I believe Mr. Marshall said that when you include the entire lot, I, I asked. With, with the stairs or without the stairs? Without the stairs. If you include the entire lot of the street, you're already over 20%. Mm -hmm. I asked that too. So how do we how do we phrase that? It's the law. Yep. The the entirety of the impervious areas on the lot um, in their current form are greater than twenty percent. All in favor? And the proposed accessory structure would increase the total area of impervious surface. All in favor? Um, the proposed stairs um, in the current design um, are, are, great, are greater than four feet in width. All in favor? Any, anything else we need facts wise or okay. <sighs> so 
then we have conclusions of law. The question is, do we just want to do the, the double-barreled ones that, that Mr. Wall suggested based on those findings of fact? I'm comfortable with that, if, if, if you all are. Um, okay, based on the record that's been developed here, um, I'm going to propose a couple of conclusions of law using the guidance that Mr. Wall has provided to us. Um, conclusion number one, um, the issuance of the permit, permit number 130036, was clearly contrary to the ordinance. All in favor? Four yea and one three now. Um, the issuance of the permit, permit number one three zero zero three six, uh, was unsupported by substantial evidence in the record. All in favor? Two in favor, three in favor? Well, that brings us to another interesting. It, it, it would be my opinion that if you determine that the incorrect standard was applied, then of necessity any conclusions drawn from that probably would be invalid. You would have, the, the code enforcement officer would have to be applying the correct standard in order to get to, to a result that's consistent with the ordinance. So any factual findings made to substantiate the incorrect standard would, in my opinion, be a nullity. So you don't have to go that route if you find the first criterion is not met. In other words. So, it, so it's, it, 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 it's, it's council's advice to us that if we, as we did, found that um, issuance of the permit was clearly contrary to the ordinance, that that ends the inquiry there for purposes of the appeal. Particularly in light of the additional factual findings you made concerning the present condition of the property and the increase of nonconformity. Okay. Then, um, We'll go right to the decision then. Uh, all in favor of granting the Murphy's appeal? All in favor? Okay, I don't think we have a choice at this point based on what the vote is. What the vote, what is. vote is, what the vote is. Okay. Wait, so, so the vote was just 3 4? Not 3 yay, 4 no. But. I heard 4 3. Yeah. That was a four, 4 in favor of the appeal? Like Let's do it again. <laughs> All in favor of granting the Murphy's appeal? So, one, two, three. Three. And uh, opposed? This All opposed. So it's. Gina. Mr. Hoffman? I voted for Oh, I, I voted for the yellow one. You voted in favor of the appeal? Yes. Yeah. All right, let's do it once more. Okay. All in favor of the appeal, the Murphy's appeal, please raise your hand. I'm changing. I'm going to vote no. Okay. All in favor of not granting the Murphy's appeal, please raise your hands. Okay. <sighs> I mean, oh my God. yeah, well, I mean, that's what yeah, that is. Can we leave? Can we leave? As you said, the vote, is, the vote is the vote. Well, can we get advice from the yeah, attorney? Yeah, advice from council here because that seems contrary to what you just I, I think you're going to need to reconcile yeah. what you've made in terms of, of findings and conclusions based upon the ultimate decision you're rendering. In, in the, it seems to me at least the first, the, the, the primary one that needs to be reconciled was the vote on the issuance of the, of the permit was clearly an error because if we have that in conflict with not granting the, the appeal, that's the one that to me. Any, didn't, didn't both those both of those conditions didn't need to be met clearly contrary and unsupported right but what I'm suggesting is that particularly in the instance we're dealing with here where you've made factual determinations that the there's an existing with the with the the lot as as you've determined it to be entirely within the shoreland zone um, that the existing condition on the property um, exceeds the permissible impermeable surface 
that the addition of the stairs would increase that nonconformity and therefore would be prohibited under the ordinance. Um, so isn't that really just a straight de novo review? Well, it's, it's because by the time it seems like the, the findings that we made before we got to the clearly contrary basically carry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's considered quasi de novo, I think, for two reasons. And this is the term the court adopted, okay. not me. Um, it's because there is a certain mixing of the records, if you will. You don't start from zero right. when you're dealing with this issue. You have a record that's prepared by the code enforcement officer. And it is augmented by information and arguments presented by persons, particularly objectors, who didn't have an opportunity to object when the permit was issued in the first place. I think the second issue pertains to what you do if you, are, you come to the conclusion that the evidence supports both conclusions equally. In other words, you found that the correct standard was applied, but that the evidence seems equal in your mind as to whether or not it meets or doesn't meet that correct standard. And in that situation, you're required, as I understand it, to affirm the uh, code enforcement officer's decision. So there you're more playing that role of an appellate review as opposed to substituting your own judgment. So in those two respects, I think what you're dealing with is not a true de novo review as a, as a court would apply it, if you will. Uh, I think that I'd like to do a reconsideration of my vote on one of the motions. Uh, I'm, not in, I'm not in favor of a repeal by the Murphys. So was it the second where I voted? It, it, that, that's been duly noted. You, you voted against the appeal, okay. correct? Right. Okay, I'm a little confused. Yes, I voted against the appeal. Okay, yep, that's, that in the record reflects that. Three in favor of the appeal, four against the appeal. I think at this point, Mr. Wall, the, the, the vote is what it is, and I think I'm not sure that we're, there's anything else we can do to, to cure what may be an infirmity with may, what may not be an infirmity. Do we have the ability to revisit those votes? We you, can, you can reconsider a decision. All right, so I, I'd move that we reconsider the issuance. Uh, I move that we reconsider our decision that the issuance of the permit was clearly in error, and we retake that vote. You mean clearly contrary to the ordinance? Uh, yes, yeah. clearly contrary to the ordinance. Okay, uh, I, I second the vote to, to reconsider, so um, we'll, we'll re vote on that issue. So. Can you um, refresh our recollections on what the votes were? So it was 4 3 that it was not clearly supported by the evidence, 3 4 that it was not supported by substantial evidence in the record. And then three, four, that the appeal was not. Um, Is that right? Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, then, uh, all in favor of moving to reconsider? The, the, the decision that the issuance of the permit was clearly contrary to the ordinance. Right. One, one of the conclusions. All in favor of voting to reconsider? Okay. Then we will re vote on the issue. I will propose the conclusion again, and then we will vote. Um, issuance of permit number 130036 by the code enforcement officer was clearly contrary to the ordinance. All in favor? Get the opposed just to... Okay, all opposed to that. Four. Three. Three? I'm sorry, I'm so uh, the, the, the issue um, that I, I moved that we vote on is whether the issuance of the permit was clearly contrary to the, the ordinance itself. I vote no. So. Okay. So. Okay, so it'd be three to four. Three to four, yes. Okay. And that reconciles with that the denial of the I am going to suggest that we adjourn for the evening. Um, but look, before we vote, I want to hear 
Uh, I, I'm very sensitive to the fact that attorneys cost a lot of money as, as do consultants. As am I. Everyone's been here multiple times. And let me do this. Let me ask our tech person back there if there's any. Uh, uh, why don't you go ahead first? I mean, if you're going to adjourn, I would just like to revisit. I, obviously, we don't want that to happen. But we understand the time. So I'm not going to argue about that with you. <laughs> but I would like to revisit the issue of Jim Fisher's testimony that we raised, that we put forward in the initial appeal tonight, and see if there's any way that we can have that carry over to be part of the record on the patio appeal that the Shore Acres Association has, has raised, and that, that is one of the ones that has not been addressed yet just so that we do not have to have him come back for another night. Is, uh, is Mr. Mora here or someone from the association? Yes. Are you Mr. Moore? Yes, I am. Mr. Moore, thanks for your patience. Um, I'm tired, but I'm here. <laughs> Join the club. Um, do, would you have an issue with that? I mean, you've heard, you've heard the testimony regarding um, the high water mark and the other issues regarding measurements from is it Mr. Silver? I'm sorry. What? <laughs> Fisher. Fisher. I'm sorry, Mr. Fisher. Um, uh, would you have an issue with us being able to consider that at the next hearing without him here and reiterating it? I'm very, I'm very sensitive to, uh, to the extra expense, but I think we have a lot of different issues that uh, may require some different, uh, different advice. So, I, so I, I think, I, yes, I, we do have a problem with that. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure that that is, I'm not sure that's just dispositive. I'm just, I'm, I'm asking. I mean, it gets up to if, the If board. that's the case, then we really would prefer, if at all possible, to get this done tonight. Could we not begin there's, yes. like that, take the, say, okay, it's in the record, and then adjourn for the evening? Let me take just a two-minute break just to make sure that our, our, our cable guy is, is okay. That's, that's fine with me. He said he's fine. I don't think I don't think all right um it's now 11 30. um we're through two of the four two of the four matters that are on on the uh on the agenda for tonight um there has been some talk about whether we should adjourn for the evening or whether we should proceed. Um, there's been some concerns raised about the expense of having experts and lawyers come back. So why don't we vote um, uh, all in favor of continuing on with the next matter? Say aye. Two a.m. <laughs> Get her done. Uh, yeah, uh, I know, right? We do need some coffee. I mean, uh, we, <laughs> I so, let's just take the, the let's uh, let's start the easy one. Let's see, well, uh, <laughs> let's start with yeah. Start with the first one and revisit after the first one. Okay. Um, set.
We're now going to hear uh, <laughs> the appeal by the Shore Acres Improvement Association, represented by Mr. Mora, of the Code Enforcement Officer's issuance of building permit number 120177. Uh, it's based on the Livingston site plan drawing related to a newly constructed deck based on its location being outside the owner's property and within the deeded right of way and within the restricted shoreline setback area at 29 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 69. Sure. This, I believe, is the deck issue. Mm -hmm. that was issued 11 months in advance be uh, ago. It's a procedural point. It's okay. It's a procedural point. I'd merely like that the board ask that the board first consider the timeliness issue before we get into a long, drawn-out discussion of the merits or lack thereof. Thank you. I, I think. I move that we address the timeliness issue on this permit before the and those procedural questions before we get into the substance of this appeal? In, at the last um, hearing you brought, brought up, oh, are you, all right. do you fall under the Shore Acres Improvement Association? Yeah, no, I don't believe I do. I went back and I looked, so I do not. Right. As appealing as it is to <laughs> think about that. <laughs> I, I second Joanna's motion that we, we restrict right. discussion, at least initially, on the timeliness of the appeal. All in favor? I don't know if this is appropriate and that I'm allowed to speak, but before we even get to the timeliness issue, I think there's a standing of who has the right of way and who owns the property. So I have that information right here. There's not standing to be able to even make a decision on a permit. Um, I am a property owner and have been in this uh, community for 50 years. So I think it's moot to timeliness before we even get to who the property belongs to. I'll address the 30-day appeal yes, period that yes, we're talking about. Okay. I'm Jim Moore. I'm at 5 Wombeck, and I am representing the Shore Acres Improvement Association, which is our neighborhood association. Okay. We believe that since the CEO was without authority to even consider the permit application, the permit itself is invalid. And therefore, the 30-day time limit does not apply. Only and until the ZBA makes an initial determination on this issue does the 30-day period begin to run. Of course, I got a whole presentation on that. And do I need to go through that at this point on. as to why the CEO was without authority to even consider the permit application. I do. Okay. Well, that's pretty much my presentation, so I'll have to continue. My comment would be uh, we had a very similar issue last month uh, from an appeal that was much closer to the 30-day time period, and there was uh, extensive discussion and advice received from the town council, and we, at that point, eventually reached the decision that we did not have the authority to um, waive the 30-day window. And my position is the exact same reasoning and so on and so forth applies here. Whether for good or bad, it's uh, a precedent we had that's almost exactly on point. So. Uh, okay. And my, my arguments, as I'd like to present, are that the ordinances were not followed and that the permit should not have been issued because the ordinances were not followed. The ordinances that talk about the procedure that needs to be followed uh, in this situation. So I'd actually like to go through those if I'm allowed to do so. Please do. Please do. Please do. Okay. Okay. Right from the beginning? I think I have to. Okay. Okay, the Shore Acres Improvement Association is made up of owners in the Trendy Point Shore Acres subdivision. The subdivision was created in 1911, and I have a map of that here that shows that in 1911 this was recorded with the Registry of Deeds. At the time of creation of the subdivision, the town of Cape Elizabeth had a right of incipient dedication to all of the paper roads in this subdivision. 
including Surfside Avenue, which I have highlighted in blue. Would you like copies of this? No, I can, I, I can see it yeah. fine from here. Okay, I have copies if you'd like yeah. Okay. Uh, this can be found in the town's inventory of paper roads. To this day, the town continues to have this right of way. The town planner, Maureen O'Mara, confirmed this to Sheila Mayberry, one of our neighbors, on October 22, 2012. In addition, according to the town's own document on paper roads in the area, the owners of lots in the Shore Acre subdivision continue to have rights in any paper road shown in the subdivision plan. And I have that document. And I have uh, highlighted in here the Surfside Avenue is on the list of uh, inventory of paper streets with a, with a map showing where that's located, which is also shown on this map. These rights are implied. Can I, ask, can I just ask a, a, I want to make sure I'm not losing sight of, of maybe probably what I consider to be a very almost straightforward issue. What, what is your position on why it's your, your, that your, your appeal is timely? Or is that what you're, is that what you're going through? Or? Yes, that's what I'm going through, yes. Okay, so you don't think the 30-day time, when, did you, when do you think the 30-day time period started? I believe the 30-day time period has not started, and I'll go so You don't that. even think it started yet? Correct. How? 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 Because the... It, it, it's clearly stated here. It, it, if you can just hold on just a little bit. Okay. 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 These rights are implied easements appurtenant to, uh, uh, pertinent to the owner's lots and cannot be extinguished over town. The town has recognized these individual rights in prior cases, specifically in Shore Acres. As has been discussed, Searchside Avenue over here is a paper road that runs along the edge of the shore and abuts the lot known as 29 Pilot Point. And you can notice on this map that in 1911, the lots actually crossed here are double lots, and so Surfside Avenue was needed to access the lots on the shore side. Since then, particularly 29 Pilot Point Road, two lots are uh, now combined, and so it could be accessed from Pilot Point. But at the time, 1911, they were uh, separate smaller lots. Property was sold to Livingston sometime in 2011. It is located on a, sh a shoreland overlay performance district within a resident residential A district, which is discussed in section 19-6-11. As such, the lot is within 250 feet horizontal distance of the upland edge of a coastal wetland, including rocky ledges. On November 8, 2011, the Livingston's agent, Peter Spencer from Waterman Marine Corporation submitted an application for a permit to replace an existing deteriorating block wall with riprap wall and to replace existing 20 foot by 30 foot deck in deteriorating condition with a new 20 by 30 foot deck. The application included a site plan and should have a site Do you have a site plan in your records? I think it was sent in with our appeal. Yes? Okay. Site plan without dimensions and inaccurately represented the relationship of the property lines. So, I believe there's also, you also have a inspection of premises in the package that I sent in. Yes? So, I think if you compare these two, 
you can see, if you put them side by side and compare these two and look at the relationship of the house to the roadside boundary and the house to the deck, but the house is somewhat centered here. If you look at the inspection of premises, which is registered with the Registry of Deeds, the distance from the house to the roadside boundary and the house to the backside boundary is clearly not centered. The deck, as shown in the site plan, is on this other drawing with the Registry of Deeds, way down here someplace, off the owner's property. Okay, is that clear? In addition, the deck is clearly within the 75 foot of the normal high water line and sits directly on the Surfside Avenue right of way. So if we put it on this map, the deck is about here. Not on the owner's property and on the Surfside Avenue paper strip. Excuse me, it's on it, not beyond it. Just, you pointed beyond it first, so I just want to be clear on where you think the deck is. Is it beyond Surfside Ave or is it on Surfside Ave? Um, it's on. We, we it's on. It. it is on Surfside Avenue okay. uh, right away, yes. Mm -hmm. Rather than have the ZBA hear the request for a permit pursuant to the town's ordinances, section 19-4-4, the town's CEO independently approved the permit on November 10, 2011. Let me stop you right there. 1944B3 talks about reconstruction or replacement. It says, in part, any non-conforming structure which is damaged or destroyed by 50% or less of the market value of the structure, excluding normal maintenance and repair, may be reconstructed in place with a permit from the code enforcement officer. Isn't that exactly what happened here? We had a change of use in the structure. But aren't we also talking about the substance of the appeal when we're supposed to yeah, be talking about timeliness? Well, I, right, but I think that where he's going at this is he's saying, if you look in the first paragraph, the ZBA has to approve it. And his argument, I believe, Mr. Mora, is because the ZBA had to approve it, the 30-day clock didn't start running for your appeal, so your appeal is timely. I'm saying the second paragraph of this specifically says that the code enforcement officer can issue um, a permit to reconstruct or rebuild something, in which case there's that, that, that argument doesn't hold water anymore because he was within, at least arguably, within his power to issue it. And then in any event, we're appealing a permit that actually did issue in November a year ago. And I think part of the issue, though, that they're raising on appeal is they're saying it was also built on property that did not belong to the Livingstons. But I think at the end of the day, the issue is that the living to take that argument to its final conclusion, though, would require that the code enforcement officer do title searches for every single permit that comes in front of before him. If the Livingstons had represented to the code enforcement officer, this, these are the boundaries of our land and we're building something within our land, the code enforcement officer says, yes, that appears to, be, to have the, meet all of the necessary requirements, uh, but it turns out the Livingstons misrepresented where their land lies and something was built on someone else's land. It seems to me that issue is not something for the Board of Zoning Appeals. That's an issue to take to the courts. I think it was raised earlier that we're not here to decide right and title to land where it lies. The question is simply, was the, uh, the permit granted in compliance with the ordinance? And otherwise, I mean, someone that's building something needs to have some level of finality. We can't leave it such that uh, anyone can come in and appeal a permit that was granted in a structure built 10 years ago. It, where do we draw that line? Which is why to stick just to the standing issue, it seems that it's 30 days past when the permit was granted. What, how can we possibly say that, um, that uh, sorry, I said standing, I meant timeliness. How can we possibly say that this appeal is timely? Especially given the decision we reached last month, which was almost directly on point. I believe that what we have to use is that the code enforcement officer did not follow the ordinances and that it, sh it, it should have gone to the ZBA ahead of time and he made some, he it, didn't do even the basic review of 
And I, I completely understand your position, and I'm sympathetic to your position, uh, assuming with this appeal, just for the sake of this argument, that you're utterly and completely correct that the code enforcement officer did the worst job ever in the history of the world in reviewing the permit. Nevertheless, the 30-day period begins to run. And the, the way that this is structured, we can't leave it that you have 10 years to appeal a permit just because the CEO improperly granted it. In right or wrong, whether, whether the ordinance should be written this way or not, the problem fundamentally at the end of the day is there's no triggering mechanism to notify the neighbors that permits have been granted. They're, they're just not as part of our, it's not part of our ordinance. There is notice, there's no notice requirement in here. Right or wrong, it's just not there. The 30-day period starts, and once it's passed, as we discussed in the vote last month, as we received advice from the town attorney, we don't have the ability to say good cause exists to waive the 30-day requirement. And that's the conclusion we reached last month, and I, my position is that that's binding on us. Oh, a comment, please. What you're saying is that the uh, um, the fact that the, the CEO did not have any authority to make the decisions that he made, uh, you're saying that the, the zoning board is also without authority to do anything about that. And, 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 and so what we are left with is an unfair process that allows unauthorized permits to be issued in the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, they're invalid permits. They, they're, uh, they don't carry any weight with, uh, with anything in the ordinance. Uh, um, now, I, I know you're nodding your yes, head and yes. you're saying, yes, I agree. The, the example I, I gave agree, last. I agree. Now, I, lot, I gave the example of, say, he authorized a 12-story structure on that lot. And the, uh, that was the example I gave last month. And unfortunately, under the ordinance, we can't reach that after the time period passed. You, we, may, you may not want to um, decide to retract the permit because there could be a possible timeline problem on your own accord, knowing the facts of the actions on the part of the CEA, on your own accord, you could make a decision to hear uh, what the issues are. So that was the issue before us last month, and the town attorney and the argument that came from the Livingstons that eventually we, the board, I speak just for myself, but I assume this is what the board reached the conclusion on, was that the mechanism that exists is to go to the courts, and for, at the courts argued that there's good cause to waive the 30-day period. This is a different, slightly different issue, though. On your own, you could take action on a case that's before you, uh, regardless of whether or not a permit was valid or invalid. Um, you could do that. I think you have the authority. To, there's nothing in the zoning code that says that you can't take action on a particular issue. I mean, the only, the only difference is we are here because uh, we had noticed that something happened, okay? But you can do something about it. And I know that your attorney said, oh, they have to, uh, they have to go to court. Uh, well, maybe on that, uh, on that initial basis that you indicated, we, you know, maybe we do. But that doesn't mean that you can't initiate action on something that you know about now. And I, I am, you can and initiate it. I, I am, Why can't you initiate it? I'm just one member of the board, but I'm incredibly sympathetic to your position because I believe that everyone should be given the opportunity to have their, their argument heard, which at a minimum would mean that you should be able to present your argument, we should consider and reach a conclusion. But there's, this, there's a restriction that says that, there's my position, that we have 30 days 
after that 30 days, we as a board, we 30 believe days from what? The 30 days from the issuance of the permit. Whether, what permit? Whether right or wrong, or whether right or wrong, that's all the power we have been designated by the, this is my position, by the town council, and we don't have any power to go beyond that, whether right or wrong. I think at the end of the day, if there Do was, you have the power to decide whether or not the code enforcement officer uh, violated procedure? Only for 30 days after it was issued is my position. And, and that's it? Uh, we, only, we only work with what we have. This is, we, didn't, we didn't make these rules. Did we just get the hand? Huh? The, now, now, now um, uh, I think Mr. Uh, Mora uh, does need to state further his basis uh, with respect to uh, the time issue. He has not gotten to it. I think it's only fair that given what has happened here, that he be allowed to, to finish his presentation on this issue. It's only fair given not only the history of this matter, the time we've spent here waiting for five hours to do this, I think you at least need to let him complete what he needs to say. It, and there, I won't, oh, go ahead. The timeliness issue is a relatively clear issue and it is very clearly delineated based on our historic decisions and on Maine state case law. Well, I Please let me finish. And what we have voted as a board is that we are open to hearing arguments regarding the timeliness issue and that procedural issue alone. We are not asking right now for a substantive discussion of the issues in the underlying appeal. To the extent that there is discussion of those substantive issues right now, I think that there needs to be a time limit on how much additional time we're giving to talk about the procedural issue, decide on the procedural issue, and then there can be additional time for the substantive issues. Not tonight, though, right? I think, Christopher, and you were very clear that this trip shouldn't go on. The decision was already made. You know, very, very well, bad. we're going to, that's where we're going. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I would, wh what I need to say to you is that his argument Who's includes argument? Mr. Morris. He's not even done with his time issue, his time limitation issue, and you need to let him finish. That's all I have. Well, I wanted to just ask one well, quick question related to the timeliness. My name is Barbara Freeman. I live in Shore Acres. My question is, I just watched a very long process and watched the town's attorney render a judgment about what was the legal responsibility of the ZBA given their previous findings or those fact things that you did. And yet at the end of the day, two people supported the town attorney's position and the rest did not. Therefore, it doesn't seem to me that the attorney's ruling on what you all are bound to do and what you have the ability to do, say with regard to timeliness, is quite as cast in stone as you would have us think at this point. Thank you. Can I move that we set a five, limit time, five minute time limit for the procedural issue from each party? All in favor? I second. All in favor? I'm giving five more minutes. Uh, yeah, for, for each five minutes, for five minutes to each side. On uh, standing. For on timeliness. Or, sorry. I'm going to get to mixing this. How about that standing? <laughs> Okay. Was there um, a vote? You have the memo. I think it was unanimous. Was it? Do you have the memo from Mike Morse on uh, August uh, 30th? Mm -hmm. On August 30th, 2012, DEP Representative Mike Morse reported that an investigation of the site indicated that the location of the reconstructed deck was determined to be 50 feet plus or minus from the shoreline. That's from the DEP method and not necessarily our interpretation of the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance method. He also stated that the town shoreline zoning provision required the ZBA not the CEO to approve the location of the new structure after considering that its location meets the shoreline setback to the greatest practical extent. He stated that the CEO erred procedurally by not adhering to the ordinance requirement in approving the reconstruction of the new deck. Mr. Morse stated that site conditions considered during his inspection clearly revealed the deck could easily have been reconstructed in a location that would comply with the minimum shoreline setback requirement. He stated that since the CEO acknowledged his oversight and regretted his decision, the owners 
The owners already constructed a new deck at the location approved by the CEO. The owners would not be required to re remove the deck. Despite the DEP finding, the CEO failed to act by retracting the permit when he knew of the nonconformance. So we have, you know, we have the memo on the 30th, and we appealed within 30 days of the 30th, when at that point we know that the CEO knew about the shortcomings and decided not to act on them. So, so your argument is that the 30-day window is met because of the fact that it runs from the, when the CEO realized his error on the 30th, and therefore, because of that, you have met the 30-day window? Yes. So the, the issue with that, and I'm sympathetic to that argument, is that if someone brings to the attention of the CEO an error that was made 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, let's say 100 years ago, and the, and the CEO says, oh, no one ever realized this. My God, you're the first person to discover it. The 30-day window, the 30-day period cannot begin to run at that point. That's just not realistic. People have to have a expectation of finality with the permit. It, it, in, in the 30-day window, it's a balancing act. It, it says you cannot start for, we're going to grant you this permit. If you start in the next 30 days, it, and lo and behold, the permit was improperly issued, you know what? You're going to have to incur the cost of fixing this problem that you've created by starting without waiting for the 30-day period to run. Whether it should be 30, 60, 90, 100, I don't know. The, but what has been told to us is it's a 30-day window. Whether there should be notice given to abutters, I don't know. I possibly would think there should be. But nevertheless, there's no requirement. And it's been met. My perspective is that 30 days began to run when the permit was granted. I understand your position that it should be measured from when the CEO realized the error. But my position is that's not the way the ordinance is read. Okay. Uh, I think we have a couple minutes, so we have an another comment. Hello, I am Sue Garrett. I live in Shore Acres. I am at 2 Katahdin Road. I have been a 50-year resident of Cape Elizabeth, and I know a lot of these nuances. Um, I would like to say for the record that I am a val valid owner of the property, so I am stating that the permit is invalid. So I am coming to you as a board that the permit is invalid, not for you to decide who owns the property or who does not own the property, but I f feel that the CEOO failed me as a Resident of Cape Elizabeth, these issues in Shore Acres have been disputed timelessly and time again. Surveyors do not like to come into the neighborhood because it is very unclear. There is plenty of constructive knowledge for the CEOO to discuss this with the community members of Shore Acres. It has not been done. I feel the permit itself is invalid. If you people are not the people I complain to about, I want it established for the record, and if it's litigation, it's regretfully litigation, but we are the owners. I have numerous documents to support that, so I state for the record it's an invalid permit, and I appeal to you to um, rescind the permit due to its being invalid from the get-go. Thank you. To, to clarify, Mr. Moritz, uh, statement with respect to the August uh, 30th DEP letter. Um, I, I think the issue is that he, that CEO made a decision. He made a decision and the decision was not to do anything. That was a decision. And appeals from any decision of the CEO go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Now, the permit is one thing. His decision to not act on the basis of his information is another. There's nothing in, this, nothing in the zoning code that, that limits us to appeals uh, on just permits. He made a decision. Any decision of a CEO can be appealed to the zoning board. And how would you define that decision? It was the decision not to do what? The decision was not to uh, retract the permit. So the from my perspective, and I don't speak for the entire board, to create a, that argument, it, it proves too much because basically it would allow anyone to revisit any permit 
by simply going to the CEO and saying to them, saying to him, the, the permit that you issued 150 years ago, I want you to retract that one. And when he says no, that would suddenly reopen that decision. Well, you know, I, 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 that's, that's one interpretation, but Section 19.3-1, uh, the last sentence says, appeals from decisions of the code enforcement officer shall be to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Did anyone from Shore Acres Association go to him the day that the DEP letter came out and said, I want you to decide that you're not retracting the permit? Or are you inferring that he made a decision on the date he received it's that letter? It's pretty clear. Not he, had, he, he was told. So you're inferring that he made a decision on that date not to do something. That's not an appealable decision. Why not? It just is not. Oh, that, okay, so that, that is coming from an opinion of a board member of the zoning board, apparently. It's an omission. It's, it's, a, it's a decision not to act. But, but I mean the, is that an appealable the, the, decision? The, the, the CEO doesn't act every day. I mean, he, he doesn't act on certain things every day. That doesn't suddenly... At, at each instance where he has an opportunity to make a decision and he doesn't, that suddenly there's not, there, it, it's, there's not, a, we, an appeal doesn't ripen simply. There, there, was, a, there, was, an August, there was an August 30th letter and he had the opportunity to act. Yeah, we're, yeah. I think we're done. Um, okay, so that, that's what I wanted to clarify, that it was act, it's an actual decision on the part of the CEO. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I have your name for the record? Sheila Mayberry. You don't have to use all five of your minutes. <laughs> I hope not. I, I hope to be done in about 30 seconds. Uh, everything that they've argued has come before law court and been rejected. The whole is the decision of the CEO, that's what we're appealing from, it's the decision not to issue the permit. Well, that's right, V-Town of Kennebunk Port, which my law firm lost on that very argument. Uh, the, uh, oh, he should have acted to, to revoke the, the uh, permit as soon as Mike Morris told him it was wrong. Well, that's Giuliano v. Town of Poland. Thankfully, it was not involved in that one, but Giuliano says that, uh, no, CEO is bound by the 30-day the time period like everyone else. The whole, uh, it's without merit, it, it's without any validity. That's the dissent in bracket from Justice Alexander, which was not affirmed by the majority court. The majority court said you have to follow these three things, and it's a judicial decision. That's what it is. It's a judicial decision. Unfortunately, it's not for this board to decide. And, and I put to you, they haven't even... I haven't even argued that they meet any of the standards in bracket or vials anyway. So even if it were, I don't think that they've met it. But I think it's a judicial decision, and you have no choice but to dismiss it. Thank you. I'd, I'd just comment on the, the last point, that we haven't sought from them any facts on whether they meet that, uh, that standard. So to the extent that we find in your favor, we haven't in any way reached whether. That, that, that's fair enough, although I think that they were given an opportunity to try to develop a record on, on that. So I'm going to respectfully disagree with you, but I understand what you're saying. I would, I would also like to just clarify for the record that any comments that have been made tonight regarding the underlying decision of the CEO were not based on review of the merits of the underlying decision. We are solely looking at the procedural issue of standing. Sorry. Timeliness. Move to close the record. Second. All in favor? I'd actually like to move to findings of fact, unless we want to have discussion first. I think I, I know how I'm going to vote, so if you guys feel the same, we'll go to findings of fact. Number one, Shore Acres Improvement Association is an association of homeowners who claim an interest in Surfside Avenue, a quote, paper street, unquote, depicted on a plan of part of Shore Acres recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds the plan book 25, page 54. All in favor of this finding, in fact? Two, the Paper Street, Surfside Avenue, abuts the Livingston's property that is the subject of building permit number 120177, i.e. 29 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 69. All in favor? Three, <clears throat> on November 2nd, 2011, a Livingston's filed an application for a building permit with the code enforcement officer 
seeking a permit for a pertinent part, construction of a 12 by 30 foot deck to replace an existing deteriorated 12 foot by 30 foot deck at 29 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 69. All in favor? <clears throat> number four, on November 10th, 2011, the code enforcement officer issued building permit number 120177 to the Livingston's for, in pertinent part, construction of a 12 foot by 30 foot deck to replace an existing deteriorated 12 foot by 30 foot deck on property the Livingston Zone at 29 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 69. I'd like to strike the, that the Livingston Zone because that's an issue that's contested. Fair enough. On property located at 29 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 69. All in favor? With, with Mr. Strauss' caveat that we're, we're not finding one way or the other that that property belong, own, is owned by the Livingstons. Uh, five, on September 19, 2012, Shore Acres filed with the Code Enforcement Officer an appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals challenging the issuance of building permit number 120177, in particular the decision to permit the construction of a 12 foot by 30 foot deck to replace an existing deteriorated 12 foot by 30 foot deck at 29 Pilot Point Road, tax map U12, lot 69. All in favor? Any more findings of fact? I'm prepared to move to conclusions. I, 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 I guess I'm okay with what we just took about it being deteriorating and so on and so forth because we didn't fully go into the details on that. But yeah, let's go. Okay. Um, proposed conclusion. The notice of appeal of permit number 120177 is untimely and that it was brought more than 30 days after issuance of the same. All in favor? Uh, decision. Uh, all in favor of dismissing the Shore Acres appeal is untimely. And that, that's that on that one. I'd just like to say, I guess, one thing for um, particularly the residents of, of Shore Acres and just generally. I mean, this, and this came to light, obviously, in the last, the meeting from last uh, month as well. But, um, you know, the ordinance is pretty clear as far as what we're able to do and not able to do on administrative appeals. Um, we can't go outside what we're empowered to do. Um, one of the things that has become clear here is that, um, and I asked this of the, of the CEO last month, the, the permit, once it's issued, just needs to be on the property. It doesn't need to be pasted on a front window or on a front door or anything like that. And that's really the only notice that, that any of us have, that construction of any sort sometimes is going on on, on a parcel of land. And, and I'm all for, you know, a, a, a modification of, of that protocol such that perm, building permits in the future that are issued are visible for, for all residents uh, because it's, it's clear if you don't, some, sometimes you just don't know if the 30-day, when the permit's been issued so, and you don't know the 30-day clock is running as a consequence. So I, I said it last month, I'll say it again. I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic in this regard. I think many of us on the board are, um, but we are, you know, limited to, to the timeliness issue in the ordinance. Um, but there are procedural things that I think all of us as citizens or you as citizens can, can do to, to change some of those protocols. So, I would so. endorse that. I'm posting building permits for town hall. All right, well, it's now 10 past 12. Um, I'm going to move that we adjourn. Um, I, can, I may be outvoted. I may not. I, I, uh, before we, we get a second on that, I move that we, at a minimum, take in whatever the tax rate, although I guess the argument is that we don't want to split the date. Be taking, I would ar argue that we bring, make your motion, then I'll we'll vote. Okay. All in favor of adjourning? I'll uh, a second, though. Is there, someone have a second? I'll second it. All in favor? Okay. Opposed? We're
we'll need to reschedule to next week or to next month, folks. I apologize. Um, this meeting is adjourned.